Starting us off at at number 5, the Metropolitan State Hospital. Located in Norwalk, California, this hospital has roots back to 1915, when the Californian governor at the time allowed for the purchase of land to build a state hospital, specifically designed to care for individuals who had psychiatric disabilities, which at the time was on the rise. When it first came to be, it was self sufficient. It had its own farm and gardens, which kept costs at a minimum. It wasn't until after World War II, though, that the hospital's methods began to take a turn for the worse. New therapies and psychotropic medications were being used, and many of its former patients claim that the way that the hospital operated on was similar to a prison. While many of the stories about the hospital have not been confirmed, there are a few tales that have resonated with the public about it, particularly the one known as the Hospital of Seven Teeth. In 1978, a patient was said to have gone for a walk on the grounds but never returned, having been murdered by a fellow patient named Melvin Wilson, who confessed to the police in 1980. He had dismembered her body and placed it in three separate graves, and kept her teeth as souvenirs. Now, The hospital itself was closed in 1992, with most of the building demolished by 2009 minus the hospital's administration building. Moving on to number 4, Beechworth Lunatic Asylum. Beechworth is located in Australia and was operational for 128 years before it was closed in 1995. Now, according to the stories, over 9,000 patients had died while being treated there, and those who visit it today claim to see faces floating in the building's windows. Its structure was interesting. They used a variation of wall structure called the Ha Ha Wall to keep patients inside the courtyard. These walls consisted of a trench dipping down towards the wall so that it presented a taller looking wall to prevent any Anyone from trying to escape by climbing, all while looking like a regular wall on the outside so the asylum did not give off the impression of a prison. Getting out legally was even more difficult though. Patients, who only required two signatures to enter, required eight signatures on their paperwork in order to be discharged. It's also said that the man who used to transport the dead bodies out of the asylum killed himself there, and that his ghost, along with a woman who was thrown out of a window, still linger on the grounds. Number three on this list is Grey Le Bains. This is a commune that is in the southeastern part of France. The reason why this town is so haunted is because of all the conflicts that have taken place there over the years. If you name any significant war that has happened within France, it's most likely that at some point or another, a battle was fought at this place. This has caused a lot of untimely death of soldiers and also the civilians who were living there. All of this death has left some spirits behind and made it so that this town is deeply haunted. Even though this is a town, the area that is most haunted seems to be located close to the castle at the top of this town. The reason that I say at the top is because this is a mountaintop village and the way that this town is laid out has the castle right at the zenith. Therefore everything is cascading down from this haunted castle that towers over the rest of the residents. There isn't one ghost who lays a rule to this town, but a collection of ghostly spirits. It's said that if you walk around the castle at night time, then many voices will start to speak out of thin air. Shadows will dance on the walls as if someone is around you, but once again there will be nothing. People also report having a a deep sense of uneasiness when they're in this area and feel unwanted. The ghosts here don't sound as dangerous as some of the other ones, but I still don't recommend checking this place out. Number two on this list is Chateau de Blende la Tour. This is a castle that is located directly in the village of Blende la Tour. This castle certainly isn't the most ornate in nature. It looks to prioritize functionality over beauty. This was largely because its main use was during the 100 years war and the French wanted to make sure it wouldn't get captured by the British. This castle is very unique with its haunting. It's always haunted by one specific ghost which I'm going to get into, but on one particular day of the year this place goes off the rails with paranormal activity and it's this event that has given the castle the title as the most haunted castle in all of France. At midnight on All Saints Day, which is on November the 1st, it's said that a plethora of phantoms will fly out and circle around the tower of this castle. They will scream and wail and cause a major ruckus. People have also said that these wailings feel inherently sinister in nature, almost as if these ghosts are driving people away from this place. Reports have also said that chains can be heard smashing against the walls, and screams from below in the tower are heard as if people are locked up there. This event only takes place on November 1st at midnight though, and is now part of the lore and culture around this village. On a regular day, this castle isn't completely without ghostly apparitions though. The ghost of the master of the castle from the 11th century walks throughout in a bloodied outfit. 
It's said that he was murdered with a dagger and that his spirit walks around to this day still holding that same dagger which killed him. Number one on this list is Chateau de Bonaguil. This castle is located in saint francois sur la and was built in the medieval ages. It's decently well kept considering how old it is today. As with most castles that were built around that time, this one played a critical role in the 100 years war. It's said that it was fought over multiple times and retaken by both sides multiple times as well. Aside from its deep history, reports of a potential haunting have run rampant all throughout France. In fact, people were so convinced that a spiritual presence was living here that a team went to go investigate it. This group of paranormal experts went in and made some startling discoveries. They said that when they got there, the thing that they noticed and detected the most was the sensation of somebody touching their shoulder, as if somebody was right behind you and had their hand just on one of your shoulders. This went hand in hand with a sensation of burning. Apparently the burning didn't have them in pure agony, but they were all reportedly uncomfortable for sure. The temperature changes didn't stop there either because it also got incredibly cold all of a sudden. Creepy noises, loud shouts, and a very guttural and deep moan that echoed throughout the castle were all things that this group had reported as well. Nobody knows who or what ghostly spirit is causing these occurrences, but it's clear that something isn't quite right about this French chateau. Number five on this list is Cleveland Grays Armory Museum. This building was constructed in 1893 for the Cleveland Grays, who were a volunteer private military company. The group helped law enforcement and dealt with other criminal ongoings that attacked the city streets. They continued helping out the military for as long as the government would allow them to, but after World War I, were no longer allowed to enter as a private group. However, they obviously had a lot of weapons and things of that nature that nobody would be using anymore. So today, there now stands the Cleveland Grays Armory Museum. These guns and cannons don't stand alone though, as there are ghosts living among these walls as well. Disembodied voices and things moving when they're not supposed to are all very common occurrences at the Cleveland Grays Armory Museum. The legend actually became so famous that this place was featured on Ghost Hunters, where they investigated the building and determined that this place is in fact haunted. However, luckily for us, and a reason why you still might be able to go to this place is that the ghosts are supposedly out there for a good time. These professionals determine that the ghosts are not fueled by anger, but just chilling out in the museum and living their best ghostly lives. Still though, there are many apparitions of military men who will appear, as well as ghostly footsteps and sounds that just don't make any sense at all. It's all very creepy, even if the ghosts are only out for fun. It would probably be a pretty cool place to check out, just make sure that you aren't faint of heart. Number four on this list is Erie Street Cemetery. This is apparently one of the spookiest places in the state and not a spot that you should want to be burying your loved ones. Only in your state rights, in 1826, this charming cemetery was established on East 9th Street, though it was known as Erie Street at the time. Before then, a community burial ground was maintained near modern day public square. Expansion, of course, eventually caught up with the cemetery and it's now right across the street from Progressive Field. This growth once threatened the cemetery's existence as bodies were removed from the cemetery in the early 1900s to make space for the new development. This preparation was shut down when the Pioneers Memorial Association was founded, so the burial grounds remains, yet it now feels oddly out of place. Perhaps one of the most unforgettable stories is that of Jock Osot, also known as Walking Bear. Jock Osot was the proud chief of the Meskekai, a tribe that existed in Iowa. Following the conclusion of the Black Hawk War, Jock Osok came out east to hunt. He made the acquaintance of Dan Marble and joined his theater troupe, traveled to England, and even came into the favor of Queen Victoria. However, he fell ill and parted ways with the troupe. Legend maintains that Jock Osot was making his way home to his ancestral lands, anticipating his demise, but that he passed in Cleveland before he reached his intended destination. As a result, local myth maintains Jock Osot remains eternally restless. His local friends like Dr. Horace Ackley arranged for his burial in Erie Street Cemetery. His dismay at being unable to return home caused him to crack his stone grave marker. This ghost has been spotted so many times and haunts those who pass by here. He's even said to haunt the Cleveland Guardians baseball park, which is just across the street from this cemetery. His ghost is forever restless and just wants to get home, but 
I'm not sure that he ever will though. In at number three, we have Cork District Lunatic Asylum. The Cork District Lunatic Asylum opened in 1789, and by 1845, the Irish Lunatics Asylum Act allowed for appropriating the lunatic asylum in the city of Cork to the purposes of a district lunatic asylum. The legislation provided for two new asylums a criminal one in Dundrum, Dublin, and then a 500 bed asylum in Cork. This building was originally in three separate blocks, laid to be joined together in the interest of providing more accommodation. To become the longest facade of any building in the country, it opened in 1852. William Saunders Halloran was an Irish psychiatrist who worked at this asylum from the time it opened until his death and was the author of Practical Observations on the Causes and Cure of Insanity. This doctor's methods were extreme and torturous. He created something called the Halloran's Chair, which rotated hysterical patients up to 100 revolutions per minute. It rarely had the desired effect. Inmates lived out their days in a state of paranoia and despair while admitted at the asylum. The horrors of this place finally ended when the asylum was closed in 1992. It stayed abandoned for many years and locals and tourists went to visit this scary place. They claim the tortured souls still remain here and paranormal investigators even visited and claimed to have seen both and heard voices of these tormented souls. Today the building is being converted and renovated into apartments called Kins Hall. In at number two, we have the Hellfire Club. The Hellfire Club is located on Mount Pelier Hill in Dublin. The building gets its name because it's believed to be one of the first Freemason lodges in Ireland. Around 1725, William Connolly, who was one of the wealthiest men in Ireland at the time, built this building to be a hunting lodge. Years after the build, the roof was blown off during a storm, and locals believed it was the work of an aggressive spirit seeking vengeance on Connolly for building on their land. And that's when the story started swirling. After Connolly's death, the building was quickly sold and is said to have become a meeting place for the Irish Hellfire Club. The club was founded in 1735 by Richard Parsons, a known dabbler in black magic. The members met at locations across Dublin and were known for their immoral behaviour and debauchery involving alcohol and sex. The secrecy surrounding the club members led to speculation that they were satanists and devil worshippers. The president of the club was named the King of Hell and dressed like Satan with horns, wings and hooves. The members were said to set a place at each meeting for the devil in the hopes that he would attend. They were also said to hold black masses in the lodge during which cats and even servants were sacrificed. Some say the building was deliberately set on fire in order to enhance its hellish atmosphere. The best known Hellfire Club story is the one in which the devil himself appears. A stranger had joined the members at a game of cards. At some point one of the card players dropped a card on the floor. As he bent down to retrieve it, he noticed that the stranger had cloven hoops instead of feet. Another tale concerns a young farmer, curious to find out what went on in the meetings. Climbing up Mount Pelier Hill one night, he was invited by members of the club and allowed to witness the night's activities. He was found the next morning trembling and terrified. Tradition says he spent the rest of his life unable to speak, unable even to remember his name. The Hellfire Club remains burnt out and abandoned on Mount Pelier Hill looking over Dublin. It is a beautiful sight on a sunny day, but make sure you leave before night. It's a beautiful sight on a sunny day, but make sure you leave before night comes because you may come into contact with the unusual smells ghostly apparitions or paranormal sightings, and it's said that satanic rituals are known to be done here. And finally in at number 1 we have Leap Castle. Of the many haunted places in Ireland, Leap Castle is possibly the most notorious of all, and is one of the most well known symbols of haunted Ireland. This place is located in Calderry in County Offaly. There are many accounts of when the main tower was constructed, but could go back as far as 1250 CE and was built by the O'Bannon clan. The O'Bannons were the secondary chieftains of the territory and were subject to the rule ruling O'Carroll's clan. There are many stories of who or what haunts this place. A red lady ghost is reported to walk the halls holding a dagger, and also two little girls named Charlotte and Emily are reported to run up and down the spiral staircase in the mansion. A red lady ghost is reported to walk the halls holding a dagger, and also two girls named Charlotte and Emily are reported to run up and down the spiral staircase in the mansion. Emily passed away after she fell from the top of the castle's tower, and Charlotte can still be seen running around after her sister and calling her name. The castle was visited by paranormal investigators from shows like Most Haunted and Scariest Places on Earth. These investigators believe the castle is haunted by a sinister elemental spirit. The creature is described as being about the size of a sheep with a human face, black holes for eyes and nose, and giving off the smell of a rotting corpse. During renovation of the castle in the 1900s, workers found an obliette behind a wall in the chapel. 
At the bottom of the shaft were many human skeletons on wooden spikes. When cleaned out, it took three cartloads to remove the bones. Today, the dungeon is now covered over in order to keep people away from it. It's believed that the O'Carrolls would drop guests through the trapdoor to be impaled on the spikes eight feet below and could be haunted by the people killed by the O'Carrolls. The castle describes itself as the world's most haunted house due to the numerous amounts of spirits located here. Number five, Eastern State Penitentiary. Starting off the list is Eastern State Penitentiary. It was a prison built in Philadelphia that wanted to stand out from the rest of the American penal system, trying out a new method of punishment called the Pennsylvania system. Well, do tell, what is the Pennsylvania system? It's not pleasant and has absolutely nothing to do with cheesesteaks. The Pennsylvania system refers to imposing the prisoners to solitary confinement all of the time, 24 7. The prisoners lived alone, ate alone, exercised alone, and were only ever allowed to interact with prison guards. When they were being transported or moved around the prison, the guards would make them don black hoods. Guess it's not nearly as sunny in Philadelphia as Frank Reynolds would have you believe. Now this might not surprise you, but this was not a terribly popular system with inmates. The miserable conditions made the inmates' lives horrendous, but the prison didn't care too much. The system only ended up collapsing in 1913 due to overcrowding in the prison. But Eastern State didn't let this stop them from acting sadistically, and really if anything just inspired them to get a little more creative. Prisoners would have their tongues chained to their wrists. Unruly troublesome prisoners would be chained to chairs for days on end. They would douse prisoners in freezing cold water. And perhaps worst of all, would trap prisoners into a pit they affectionately nicknamed the hole, where they'd be kept in the darkness for weeks on end. I'm really not sure if that's any better than the original system. In 1970, after decades of terrorizing its inmates, Eastern State let the last of its inmates free and closed the gates permanently, only to crack them back open a little bit as a tourist location. Reopening its walls is a haunted attraction. Due to its horrific history and ominous atmosphere, the prison was rebranded as a haunt, with legends saying that you'll hear all kinds of disembodied laughter, screaming and crying, ghostly figures, shadows moving across the wall, and unexplained footsteps. And if you're looking for more scary stories about prisons, or really about anything, then you're at exactly the right place. Stay subscribed to Top 5 Scary for more new scary videos every day. Number 4, Ohio State Reform. Ohio State is the picture of a perfect prison. I mean, literally, it was the set for the Shawshank Redemption, so it's kind of a big deal in the prison world. The prison first opened its gates in 1890 and was initially an intermediate penitentiary, a facility for first-time offenders who were deemed too violent to be in other prisons. The inmates were taught basic trades for release and reintegration. However, the prison population started to swell too much by the 20th century, and the reformatory was forced to accept inmates convicted of serious crimes. While day-to-day -day operations weren't too terribly out of the norm for any other prison, one event in the 1930s may have contributed greatly to the paranormal rumors surrounding it. In the late 1930s, a riot broke out in the East Cell Block, and as punishment, the guards rounded up 120 rioters to share 12 solitary confinement cells together for a week without any food or water. Obviously, this led to multiple, multiple prisoners passing away, and even more being broken down to the point of madness. Just outside the prison stands 215 numbered graves, a monument to all the horror that the prison had experienced over the years. Since then, the prison itself has reformed rehabilitating itself much like Eastern State as a haunted house. Visitors and tour guides who walk through Ohio State report feeling inexplicable chills while walking through the prison's walls. Witnesses say they hear cell doors slam and see dark figures. Those brave enough are welcome to take the prison's tour and attempt to track down spirits of their own, or if you're feeling particularly festive for the Halloween season, you can try the Haunted Prison Experience, a guided tour replete with animatronics and actors for that haunted house feel. Number three on this list is South Bass Island Lighthouse. Located in South Bass Island on Lake Erie, this lighthouse and the island it's on is honestly rather beautiful. Super cute and super quaint, it's kind of like the place that you'd want to go for a day trip with your significant other. However, you may not want to take said significant other to the South Bass Lighthouse itself. It housed lighthouse keepers in the late 1800s. The weirdness began back in 1898 with Harry Riley, the lighthouse keeper, and his assistant, Sam Anderson. Anderson was a bit of a weirdo. He was said to have captured snakes on the island and then bring them to the basement of the lighthouse, where he kept a bunch of them. Anderson apparently lost his mind, though, during the time that he worked at this place. Apparently, there was a small epidemic, and he freaked out at the prospect of having to stay in quarantine. Triggering a little bit? It's thought that he took his own life by jumping off 
off of the cliff portion of the island. Then later on, the lighthouse keeper Harry was found hopelessly mad running around the island like a lunatic. It was the two stories of these men that launched the legends of a haunting at this lighthouse. People are very scared of the lighthouse as they believe it to be haunted with some sort of demon that will make you go insane. A lovely and quaint little spot, but one that if you spend too much time at will literally have you lose your mind. Not to mention the ghosts of these two men have been spotted from time to time running around frantically looking as if all their wits are totally gone. Number two on this list is Edwin Shaw Hospital. Edwin Shaw Hospital has truly seen it all and it's no wonder that it's deeply haunted today. It initially opened in 1915 as a hospital specifically for tuberculosis. Then a few years later, a side wing opened up to care for pediatric patients. Needless to say, during these periods, there was a lot of death that took place. Then in 1947, things changed drastically and became a place for abandoned children, those who lost their parents or those who suffered for the next few years of this place's operation, there were a decent amount of scandals that took place. Tons of reports of mistreatment of these children, with some patients even taking their own lives during this time. Eventually, this became a psychiatric hospital as well, and as you can probably imagine, it saw its fair share of human rights violations and scary things. Now, this place is no more, it's completely demolished, but the area is still deeply haunted. Ohio Exploration went prior to its demolition in 2017 and saw its haunted nature firsthand. They write, Of course, with such a rich and diverse history, it is no surprise that Edwin Shaw was said to be haunted. The spirits of not only the tuberculosis victims, there are 246 buried in the hospital cemetery, but also of those children who took their own lives and those who fell victim to ill fates were said to haunt the hospital and its grounds. Doors opened and closed by themselves and sounds of spectral footsteps footsteps were often heard in the halls. The sounds of a meal being served in the mess hall were heard quite frequently, but upon inspection, the hall was completely empty. Ghostly humming and other odd sounds were heard in Sunshine Village, where the bulk of the paranormal activity was said to take place. Be very careful, guys, of this place in Ohio. Number one on this list is Moonville Tunnel. Moonville Tunnel is a deeply haunted tunnel in Ohio that locals are perpetually afraid of. Jim Reed says, According to local legend, the ghost is that of a railroad worker who was crushed by an oncoming train in the spring of 1859. The newspaper article from the MacArthur Democrat dated March 31st, 1859 reads, A brakesman was fatally injured. When the wheels passing over and grinding to a shapeless mass the greater part of one of his legs. Talk about graphic. Most who claim to have sighted the ghost of Moonville Tunnel say that he carries a lantern and is sometimes seen as a hovering orb of light. At least four other people were reported to have been killed at Moonville Tunnel as well, although the details, they kind of vary. Some legends claim that Moonville was struck by a plague and quarantine and that the ghosts are of those killed by the epidemic. Others state that the ghost is that of a pregnant woman struck by a train, and still others claim that it was an 8 foot tall man who was struck. However, none of these legends are quite as popular as the initial one. This tunnel appears on tons of the most haunted Ohio lists, and it even has a pretty massive section on Wikipedia dedicated to how haunted it is. That can't be said for most other places, and just kind of leads to the legitimacy of these ghosts. On the Wikipedia page, there are also extensive stories about the Lavender Lady, the Engineer, and the Bully, who were all apparently characters that died due to this train many years ago. As Jim Reed mentioned earlier though, these are lesser legends, but still could have actually happened. Whatever or whoever is truly haunting this tunnel, it's clear that it probably isn't safe for us to be exploring. Avoid the Moonwheel Tunnel at all costs. Unless you're in a train, in that case, because considering how our ghosts became ghosts, you might actually be safe. Starting off this countdown, we have Hotel Room 333. The Langham Hotel is said to be one of the most haunted hotels in London, and Room 333 is why it has this reputation. So the hotel was first built in 1865. There are over 500 rooms and suites, and also a number of ghosts as well. There are at least five ghosts that make their presence known on the regular, but several other ghosts haunt the hotel as well. The most active ghost is said to be that of a German prince. It's believed that he threw himself out of a window on the upper story room and he passed away. Well, guests have seen this ghost on a number of occasions. He is known to move through walls and close doors. If you feel a sudden drop in temperature, it's said that that's a sign he is near. Then you also have the ghost of a man with a gaping wound on his face. They don't know what happened to him, but they know that he's terrified. 
fine looking. And you have the ghost of a butler that has been seen wandering the corridors in ripped socks. And a ghost of a man in a pale blue suit with a powdered wig on. But let's get to the most haunted room, room 333. People who have stayed in this room have encountered a number of terrifying ghosts. The first sighting was made by a BBC newscaster. He was staying in the room when he woke up to see a fluorescent ball of light floating above him. This ball slowly transformed into a human apparition. The apparition then hovered in his room. He was dressed in Victorian evening wear, but one of his legs was missing. He came towards the newscaster with his arms open and eyes wide before disappearing into thin air. Maybe the poor dude just wanted a hug, you know, he's coming out like, I don't know. Another ghost that haunts this room is the ghost of a doctor who took the life of his wife on their honeymoon. This guy often appears wearing a cloak and often has blank staring eyes. And lastly, we have Emperor Napoleon III. Apparently he lived at the Langham Hotel during his last days in exile and has also made an appearance in room 333. In our fourth spot today, we have Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden is a well-known individual in American criminal history. If you don't know who who she is? Well, hey, here's a quick little nursery rhyme that'll teach you all about her. Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. That's a sick nursery rhyme based on the real murder Lizzie Borden committed. But it turns out she only struck her mom 19 times and her dad 10 times. I mean, it's still bad, but anyways, back in 1892, her parents were found dead. After investigating the scene, Lizzie was the only person who seemed guilty. Although her case is pretty controversial. Some say she did it, others say she didn't. Anyways, the Borden Murder House is now a bed and breakfast museum. In case you want to stay in a real place where gruesome murders happened. And turns out that Lizzie, as well as others, haunt the grounds. Late at night, apparently she could be heard laughing at the top of the stairs. Others have seen doors open and close on their own. Or they'll just be chilling out, minding their own business, when all of a sudden they get a whiff of Lizzie's perfume. On top of that, others have heard the traumatized maid screaming for help. And and others have seen her parents walking the grounds. Number three, Missouri State Penitentiary. Once dubbed the bloodiest 47 acres in America, it is no surprise at all that Missouri State Pen is home to all kinds of rumors to be haunted by the souls of its former inmates. The prison was nicknamed The Walls, and shortly after its construction, was already home to 2,000 inmates, doubling that size in the progressing years. The prison was home to several, several riots and escape attempts, with the most in infamous attempt occurring in 1954 when some 2,500 inmates participated in a massive day-long riot. Four buildings burned and the National Guard was called in. Shockingly out of this, only four inmates were fatally injured during this event and none managed to escape, lending to the prison's hard reputation. Now, the prison has always been reported to be haunted, even during its operation, with both guards and inmates during its service claiming to see spectral apparitions. Most of the ghost stories come out of the prison's oldest building, the A Building, home to some of the crueler punishments, including an underground room called the Dungeon, a dank, hostile basement with a low ceiling forcing prisoners into a subservient position where the only light that could be observed was a slit through the door. Modern visitors to the dungeon complain of the disgusting odor of bodies that's pungent and they feel like they're being watched. Disembodied voices have even been picked up by EVP monitors while wandering through the dungeon. In the control room, visitors report occasionally seeing a spirit called Fast Jack, a medical practitioner from the prison's operating days, who can be seen appearing as a ghastly figure holding a clipboard and a white lab coat, frantically scurrying around the control room trying to carry out some duty from when he was alive, slamming lockers and opening doors. Several ghost hunting groups over the years have investigated the Missouri State Pen, including legendary ghost hunting hero Zach Baggins and the Ghost Adventures crew, finding mysterious voices and what looked like shadow people wandering the halls. Although the bloodiest 47 acres in America might have dried up and the walls are now open to the public, for the inmates who are still impounded there, it's as terrifying as ever. Number 2. West Virginia Penitentiary Almost heaven. West Virginia, Blue Ridge Mountains, and haunted prisons. The Appalachians might be home to one of the most beautiful parts of the United States, but West Virginia Penitentiary is anything but. In 1863, after West Virginia seceded from Virginia Classic, the new fledgling state needed its own prison, and Moundsville, West Virginia, was 
chosen as the home for their new state pen. The prison's conditions were unlivable. West Virginia Pen frequently made the Department of Justice's top 10 violent prisons in the country. Idea for a new video. An infamous spot in the prison was known as the Sugar Shack, a small rec room for the inmates that served as a hotbed for all kinds of violent illegal activity. The prison is also home to a famous electric chair that an inmate was forced to build, nicknamed Old Sparky. Old Sparky is still standing there today. In the 1950s, the prison was so overcrowded that three prisoners at a time would be shoved into one cramped seven by five foot cell. The men were kept like animals in cages. Riots and violent outbursts were fairly commonplace. The prison was overcrowded, dilapidated and run down, and staffed by overwhelmed guards. Eventually, the prison would be forced to open its gates, decommissioning as a prison and shipping all of its inmates elsewhere. The building still stands and is used as a training facility for law enforcement officers, but it's been said that the spirits of those whose lives ended here still wander. Hunters report equipment malfunctioning walking by the sugar shack or any of the cell blocks where the more violent inmates were housed. Reports of banging on the walls late at night, as well as random screams are fairly commonplace too. The prison was reportedly haunted while inmates still populated it, with some of the earliest stories of hauntings stemming from the 1930s. It's thought that the prison was built on top of an indigenous gravesite of the Adena people, which has led to some speculation as perhaps an explanation for the hauntings. Like most of the prisons on this list, if you're curious enough yourself, West Virginia Penn is available to visit for tours, and you can even pop by the Sugar Shack and Old Sparky. And finally, number one, Alcatraz. Alcatraz might very well be the United States' most infamous prison. On Alcatraz Island, just outside of San Fran, lies the notorious jail, built to house America's most deadly inmates, like Al Capone, Arthur Barker, or George Kelly. It was home to a legendary breakout that was made into a film, Escape from Alcatraz, and also set the stage for Michael Bay's action classic, The Rock, which was about breaking into Alcatraz. The prison was built to drain the hope out of inmates, to break the spirits of the most rebellious inmates, and was legendary for its awful conditions. Tiny cramped cells, indifferent guards, and frequent bouts of violence and riots were all commonplace. It was once referred to as the Great Garbage Can of San Francisco, where every other federal prison dumped their worst apples. So it's no surprise, given its brutal conditions, that the island is home to several spirits and hauntings from souls that just can't move on. Most most ghost investigators report that the hottest spot for paranormal activity in the building is cell 14D, a cell that was also nicknamed the hole. Gotta wonder if they borrowed that from Eastern State. It was where the most unruly prisoners would be kept when they were being difficult. It's been said that even walking by 14D, you'll immediately feel something's wrong, as if a dark presence or energy is in the room with you. An inmate once spent his last days in 14D, screaming that he was being hunted by an otherworldly creature. Visitors report hearing crying and moaning while walking through cell blocks A, B, and C, where most of the population would been kept. It's said that a ghost named The Butcher walks through these halls after an inmate named Butcher Malkowitz, a mob hitman, was whacked by another inmate. Now, if this isn't enough haunting for you, some dark tourists also report hearing discordant, disembodied banjo strumming, thought to be a holdover from the spirit of Al Capone, who used to play his banjo in the prison band. Although the prison was decommissioned in 1963, it reopened shortly after, now as a museum and a haunted tour popular with Bay Area locals and visitors, curious about learning about one of America's darkest prisons and perhaps Perhaps it's most haunted. Visit if you dare, but just make sure you're able to leave. In at number five, we have Batstow Village in New Jersey. Located in New Jersey, Batstow Village is a historic community centered around the Batstow Iron Works. The site was ideal for iron work because there was water for mills, abundant wood for charcoal, and naturally occurring bog iron. The well-preserved and lovingly restored village dates back to 1766. As the operation of iron work grew, so did the village. There were mills, cottages, and over three dozen structures and buildings still remain, many from the early 1800s. But by mid-1800s, iron production declined due to the discovery of coal ore. As the need for iron declined, then glass making was pursued by the town, but at that point the population already started to dwindle. When Joseph Wharton purchased the property, he primarily focused on forestry and agricultural endeavours. After Joseph Wharton passed in 1909, the property was managed by a trust. The state of New Jersey began buying the land in the 1950s. The last resident to leave the town left in 19 1936, but not before stray
strange disappearances occurred, according to local legend and a bunch of conspiracy theorists. Ong's hat offers a portal to a different dimension. In the 1970s, a few professors from Princeton fled there after being mocked by their quantum physics theories. This is when they claimed to have discovered interdimensional travel. According to other local legends, the devil is the 13th born son of the Leeds, the first inhabitants of New Jersey. Mother Leeds gave birth to a healthy baby, who within minutes transformed into this beast. This old ghost town is said to be a hotspot for the Jersey Devil activity, and in the last 50 years there have been numerous reports and encounters with the beast in this area. Some of these encounters include strange tracks along with hearing screams just outside of the village. One sighting of the Jersey Devil comes from a group that saw the creatures crossing the street in front of them. When visiting the village, some say you can feel his presence as if he's walking right behind you. In at number 4 we have Bodie, California. Located up in the Bodie Hills in Mono County, California near Yosemite, in 1859 four miners found a good place to look for gold in the hills near the California Nevada border. Bodie died in a blizzard not long after, but a small mining town sprung up at their camp. The town was home to 10,000 people. Bodie was a mining camp in 1859 where people had seen gold in its hills. Eventually it turned into a well populated town. Though like most mining towns it saw its peaks, its losses and then its decline. Fast forward to 1962 and the town would be fully abandoned. Although it already showed signs of decline with dwindling numbers at the start of the 20th century, a series of fires forced the last remaining residents to flee the town, leaving it almost exactly as it was in the early 1900s. With the dinner table still set, shops are still stocked with supplies and restaurants are still poised to serve long forgotten meals. Today the 110 silent building sits spaced out for traffic and people that aren't there. Buildings such as a barbershop, a church, a mill, a morgue and a leaning hotel are hulled up by a beam and have been left untouched for 100 years. Though it has been left abandoned for years, some of the buildings are in a crumbling state of decay, while others stand strong full of their original items but long devoid of their owners. There were also 60 saloons and thus a fair amount of danger. People were robbed and crimes occurred quite often, though the curse of Bodhi has nothing to do with the fires or the sh it started because people started taking artifacts from abandoned buildings. They'd take weather-worn shoes or pieces of glass from shattered windows. Somebody once ran off with a piano. Those items may seem like they have no value, but all objects carry equal significance in telling the story of Bodhi. Thus the curse of Bodhi emerged, if you take something from Bodhi, bad luck will come around to get you. Because of the rumour spreading of a curse, people who stole items would send them back, often including heartfelt apology letters, explaining that they didn't expect their their fish to pass or their romantic life to fail from stealing from Bodhi. In our third spot we have the Banff Springs Hotel. There's one room in this hotel that was so scary and plagued with paranormal activity that they no longer let anyone in that room, and it has since been boarded up. So Banff Springs Hotel is considered a luxury mountain resort located in Canada. Seems kind of odd that it's terribly haunted, but it is. So according to a number of legends, the hotel is haunted by its tragic past. Decades ago, a family was killed in room 873. In 1928, a married couple and their daughter checked into the hotel, but they never checked out. During one night, the father ended up taking the lives of his wife and daughter before taking his own life. No one knows why he did such a horrific deed. Soon after, the room was refurbished and booked out to visitors. But weird things started happening in that room. Guests would wake up in the middle of the night to sounds of screaming. When they would flip on the lights, they would see bloody handprints on the mirror inside their room. Obviously, they would freak the hell out and then run to the front desk. But when the staff went to the room to investigate, the prince would be gone. It was happening so frequently that they decided to board up the room. In fact, if you go to the hotel today, there are rooms ending in 73 on each floor except the 8th floor. In the spot that the room should be, you can tell that a room was once there but has since been boarded up. There are lights placed above each doorway, and there is one above where this missing door would have been. Not only that, but the baseboard is cut where the door would have been. And if you knock along the walls, it sounds like it's made of thick plaster. But if you knock on the spot where room 873 should be, it sounds hollow. So it's believed that there is definitely a room 873 at the Banff Springs Hotel. And they boarded it up because it's literally haunted by the family that died in there. It's really freaky. Uh, I'm good with keeping that room sealed up forever, okay? In our second spot, we have the Axe Murder House, aka another place that you'll never catch me at. And another place 
place plagued with paranormal activity and dark history. So on June 10th, 1912, husband and wife Josiah and Sarah Moore and their three sons and daughter were found bludgeoned to death inside of their home. The killer was never caught. After investigating the bodies and crime scene, it was concluded that the dark deed was done at around 12:45 midnight. They found two cigarettes in the attic, suggesting that the killer or killers were waiting in the attic until the family went to bed. They started in the master bedroom with the parents, struck them with an axe, and then moved on. Then they returned back to the master bedroom at the end to hit the two with more blows. And now it's said that this house and the rooms in it are extremely haunted. People that have gone on tours of the house have claimed to hear children's voices and screams. Others have seen objects move and fly on their own. But in 2014, something very scary and unexplainable happened. It happened to paranormal investigator Robert Stephen Larson Jr. He was touring the house. While staying at the house, he stabbed himself in the chest. The freakiest part? He got stabbed at 12.45 am. The same time, the murders of the Moore family occurred. So yeah, maybe don't go exploring the rooms there unless you want something like that to happen to you. And in our number one spot today, we have room B340. Room B340 is a part of the Queen Mary, which is said to be one of the most haunted hotels in America. There are a number of ghosts that haunt this hotel, from Jackie, <laughs> the little girl who haunts the first class pool, to a man named John Petter, who was crushed by a watertight door, to second senior officer William Eric Stark, who accidentally drank cleaning fluid instead of gin, and one of the cooks, who was baked alive by his own staff during World War II. So yeah, a lot of dark things have happened on this ship turned hotel. Now there is one room on this ship that you never, and I mean never, want to go to, and that is room B340. It's the site of a huge tragedy. So back in the 60s, the ship was used for transatlantic cruises. Well, while on this cruise, a man went crazy and took the lives of two women in this room. When his crimes were discovered, he was locked in the room until they could dock the ship and deal with him. The door was locked from the outside and a guard was positioned outside the room so the killer couldn't escape. At one point, the guard heard the man pounding on the door saying that someone was in the room with him and was trying to kill him. Obviously, the guard was like, huh, I ain't no idiot and never opened the door. He thought that this was the guy trying to get the guard to open the door so that he could escape. Here's where it gets weird, okay? Shortly after, the guard heard nothing coming from the room, so he thought, okay, the man finally settled down and went to bed. The next day, the ship arrived in New York and the NYPD boarded the ship to arrest the man. But when he opened the door, they found the man's body parts scattered across the room. His limbs had been ripped off and they were all over the place. There was no way he could have done this to himself. So what happened to him in there? Was there actually someone in that room with him? If so, how did they get in and who is this person? It's just all so eerie and that's why you should never board the ship, let alone go to this room. But if you want to, its ship welcomes paranormal investigators or anyone brave enough to spend the night there. A number of guests have reported eerie things happening to them in the middle of the night. In 1966, a woman was staying in the room and woke up to the covers on the bed being pulled off of her. When she opened her eyes, she saw a man standing at the end of her bed. She screamed and ran out of her room, but when she did, the man vanished into thin air. Other guests have complained about the lights in the room flickering on and off or have heard sounds of someone knocking on the door in the middle of the night. Even the hotel maids have complained about the room, saying sometimes they have entered the room to find the water in the bathroom running when no one was in the room for days. So with all that being said, would you dare to spend the night there? Number 5 on this list is the Beechworth Lunatic Asylum. Located in Australia, this is one of the most haunted asylums in the entire world. Thrillist says, formerly the Mayday Hills Lunatic Asylum, now La Trobe University scenic Beechworth campus, this place saw 128 years of terror before closing in 1995. Apparently 9,000 patients died here over the years and people were so fast and loose with the term lunatic that few patients ever left the premises alive. It comes as no surprise that a few people lingered after death. Faces floating in windows are a common sight, along with Matron Sharp doing her rounds and children laughing. Tommy Kennedy, who used to transport the dead out of the asylum and died there himself, still hangs around. There's also a woman who was thrown out of a window and died in front of the hospital because she was Jewish and the only person allowed to move her, a rabbi, couldn't make it to Beechworth sooner. Yeah, so clearly this place has seen its fair share of trauma throughout the years, folks. 9,000 people is a lot of people who have died. 
Like we're talking about a small town's worth of human beings who died at this freaking asylum. And as exampled by that poor Jewish woman, these deaths weren't all from natural causes either. There was said to be some sick workers here. People who were twisted and got off on hurting others. People who worked at the asylum but probably would have been better suited to be in it themselves. Asylums in general are already susceptible to haunting considering what's going on, but when you have this amount of death and atrocities take place, it just makes it that much easier for ghosts and paranormal entities to cling on. Many of the locals don't even come close to this place anymore, and a lot of the tourists who do go here thoroughly regret that decision soon afterwards. These entities are angry and want to punish those who are living for what happened way back then. I don't recommend being one of the people who gets punished. Number 4 on this list is the Gonjiem Psychiatric Hospital. If you had a mental illness, then I promise you this is not where you wanted to end up. Thrillist says, believed to be one of the most haunted spots in South Korea, this abandoned psych hospital could be the basis for the next Stephen King novel based on its checkered history. According to local lore, patients here began dying mysterious deaths one after the other, forcing the facility to shut down. Many believe the murderous owners of the place was to blame, claiming that he kept patients as hostages only to flee to the states when families of the deceased demanded explanations. There are also rumors of doctors going insane, rivaling their patients in madness. So literally folks, if you ended up here, then there was a pretty good chance that not only did you not get the help that you needed, but you also just died. Whether this was because of the sick owners or the doctors, who even knows? That much death has left behind its mark though, and now this place looks like a safe haven for ghosts and everything paranormal. There's also been talk of a creature that lurks here, a creature that was actually the cause of all this death to begin with and is lurking, waiting for somebody to stop by and take them next. If I was you, I wouldn't want to be that person. In at number 3 we have Tlingua in Texas. The town of Tlingua, Texas was once a bustling mining town full of life, wealth and promise. Today it's a ghost town with abandoned mine shafts, a general store, an old jail, a church and multiple ghost houses. Tlingua became of interest to local miners in the late 1800s when they discovered cinnabar, a red mercury sulfide. A man by the name of Jack Dawson discovered that mercury could be extracted from the cinnabar and by 1900 there were 4 mining companies in the area area with a population of over 2,000 people. The Chaisers Mining Company owned the entire town of Tlingua. At one point they built a general store, a post office, a hotel, a school, a theatre and even a telephone service. Though conditions in the mine were tough, with the 7 day work week being the standard, working long days in the desert heat led many miners to lose their lives in the mines. To make matters worse, the Chaisers Mining Company even paid their workers in coupons, which could only be spent at the company owned store. The decline started once the mines dried up companies left and the people left with them. One of the scariest parts of the town is the church, which sits on the hill above the ghost town. One quote says, as we approached the church, the door opened all by itself. Inside the church, visitors report an eerie feeling when entering the church. Moreover, several others report experiencing blackouts, blurred vision and even hallucinations while exploring the abandoned town. Researchers theorize that this is due to low frequency sound waves in the area that are able to alter people's perceptions of the things around them and as well as disorient them. In at number 2 we have Ludlow, Colorado. Located about 12 miles north of Trinidad, Ludlow, Colorado is a ghost town known for an infamous event in 1914. A former mining camp, it was the location of the Ludlow Massacre. Beginning in 1910, the resident coal miners grew unhappy over their dangerous working conditions and began to debate a strike. By 1913, a strike had begun, much to the dismay of owner John B. Rockefeller. On April 20th, 1914, there was a massacre in Ludlow, where the Colorado National Guard and Colorado Fuel and Iron Company guards attacked miners, burning their tents to the ground. Known as the Ludlow Massacre, 25 people lost their lives. The massacre was the height of the Colorado Coalfield War, which began a year earlier in 1913. Two coal mining counties, Las Animas and Hurufano, were the centers of the conflict. The United Mine Workers of America led the strike against the Colorado Fuel and Iron, owned by Rockefeller. They were upset over the horrible working conditions. Both parties led attacks back and forth over the years. Today, the old company town of Ludlow still stands as a ghost town and the site of the tent city is also kept reserved, now under the care of the United Mine Workers of America. A monument to the deceased was also built by the union at the site. In addition, the cellar where so many innocents perished is still in place. The doorway can still be seen and the dark depths of the pit can still be viewed. Though this isn't recommended as many people who visit the abandoned ghost town report a strange feeling when looking through the doorway, and even worse, possible whispers around them with an unexplainable source. And finally, in and one, we have Helltown Ohio. The abandoned town known as Helltown 
town can be found in the Suyahoga Valley in Ohio. Thus, it's an eerie deserted town known by locals to be haunted. No people live in the area anymore, though there are still remnants of the lives of former residents left behind. The whole town is surrounded by hazardous roads that seemingly lead to nowhere. Locals believe this was done to confuse any wandering explorers. But the Helltown Church seems to have inspired the town's ominous name. The tiny white church is in the center of Helltown and is central to all local theories. Some say the church was a place of worship for practicing Satanists who still lurk around the closed off roads, hoping to recruit unwelcome visitors. Others believe the town was evacuated after a chemical spill that resulted in bizarre mutations of the residents and animal population. The legend of the Peninsula Python stems from this theory. There even sits an abandoned school bus in the town with legends of its own. The story goes that the bus was carrying a group of high school students who were going to one of the ski resorts near Boston when an elderly woman flagged down the bus. She was in a panicked state and explained that there was a young boy in her house who was seriously hurt. The bus driver, in an attempt to help, turned down her driveway and drove into the woods hoping to help the boy. When the bus approached the house, Satan worshippers swarmed it and sacrificed all those on board. The bus sat back there for over 30 years, standing as a warning to all who decide to venture into Helltown. A local paranormal investigator set out to research the abandoned town and to his surprise, what he discovered was truly frightening. He describes Helltown as not just truly abandoned, but is home to many spirits and hauntings. His personal experience with a ghost encounter was returning to his car to find strange people looking into his car windows. Both times the people vanished as soon as they saw him approaching the car before he had a chance to speak to them. In at number 5 we have Loftus Hall. This place may be the most haunted house in all of Ireland and it is said to be haunted by the devil himself. Lotus Hall is a large country house located on the Hook Peninsula in County Wexford. In 1170 Raymond Le Gros came to the county and built this massive castle which was known as the Houseland Castle. The Redmond family replaced the original castle with another in about 1350. This second castle was known as the Hall or Redmond Hall. Later in 1872 John Henry Wellington Graham Loftus undertook an extensive rebuilding of the entire mansion, adding many of the famous elements like the grand staircase, mosaic tiled floor, elaborate parquet flooring and technical elements that hadn't been seen in houses in Ireland at the time, such as flushing toilets and blown air heating. Charles Tottenham became the lord of the manor in 1752 by marrying the honourable Anne Loftus, a daughter of the first Viscount Loftus, and they had six children. However, his wife became ill and died while the girls were still young. Two years later, Tottenham married his cousin Jane Cliff, and they lived together, along with one of Charles' daughters in Loftus Hall. One evening, Charles was resting in his home in 1775 with his second wife and daughter from his first marriage, Anne, while the Loftus family were away on business. During a storm, a ship unexpectedly arrived at the Hook Peninsula where the mansion was located. A young man was welcomed into the mansion. Anne and the young man became very close. One night the family and the mysterious man were in the games room playing cards and it was then when Anne noticed the man having a cloven foot. The man went up through the roof, ultimately leading to his demise and leaving behind a large hole in the ceiling which remains today. Soon Anne became mentally ill. It's believed that the family were ashamed of Anne and locked her away in her favourite room which was known as the tapestry room. She refused food and drink and sat with her knees under her chin looking out the tapestry room window, waiting for her mysterious stranger to return until she passed away in the tapestry room in 1775. It is said that when she died they could not straighten her body as her muscles had ceased and she was buried in the same sitting position in which she had died. After her death everyone who had lived there says she still haunts the hall to this day. After being purchased by Aidan Quigley in 2011, this building was marketed as a haunted house that hosted guided tours of the house until 2020 when it was put on the market for sale. In at number 4 we have the Abbey of the Black Hag. The old abbey lies on a small valley about 2 miles east of the village of Shannon Golden in the townland of the Old Abbey. In one of the earliest nunneries in Ireland, it is first mentioned in 1298 and was founded on land donated by John Fitz Thomas of Canelo, who had died in 1261. Remains include the abbey church with two small spaces adjacent, and one appears to have been a sacristy and a vaulted building to the west. There are also walls and a gate and traces of an orchard, a fish pond and a pigeon house. Modifications to the church in the 15th century saw the inclusion of an east window in the church as well as a doorway in the north. Traces of window decoration, columns and carved tombstones remain. Barrels were also located and the church plate was reported
reportedly found in the late 18th century. It is said that the last abbess terrified the local population with her use of the black arts and sexual practices in a room to the south of the church, and is now called the Black Hag Cell. After the closure of the abbey, the hag remained there and continued to perform her unholy acts, and it's believed she lived unusually long, which caused her ancient skin to become darker and darker over time. Another legend is regarding the Earl of Desmond, and that during his escape from one of the many battles between the Geraldines and the Butlers, the Countess was wounded by an arrow. The wound was so serious that the Earl believed the Countess had died and buried her beneath the altar in the main chapel. The Countess awoke to find herself buried alive, and when people would see a ghostly figure, they went to her gravesite, and they had found her finger bones had been worn out from clawing at the coffin, and it's believed her screams can still be heard to this day. Moving on to three, the Pennhurst Asylum. The Pennhurst Asylum is one of the most famous asylums in the world. Located in Pennsylvania, it was initially known as the Eastern Pennsylvania State Institution for the Feeble-Minded and Epileptic. And it was closed in 1987 after a slew of controversy. In 1968, it was revealed in a five part news report that the conditions of the patients, who were both physically and mentally disabled, were anything but up to standard. And later in 1983, nine employees who worked there were indicted on a series of charges that included beating patients, some of which were in wheelchairs, and arranging for patients to fight and assault one another. The stories of neglect, abuse, and alleged murders have spawned many a tale about the building being haunted. The truth behind many of these stories or other heinous acts may never be known either. The institution was first commissioned in 1903. After its closure, many of the patients' belongings were left abandoned inside the building, and tourists have often claimed to hear spooky things on the asylum's grounds. There's even an alleged audio recording of voices shouting, I'll kill you, go away, and why won't you leave? Along with reports of objects moving around the building and visitors being pushed while there. And at number two, Trenton Psychiatric Hospital. The Trenton Psychiatric Hospital has a dark history, and it was the first public medical hospital in the state of New Jersey, opening in 1848. One of the staff members, Dr. Henry Cotton, the medical director, believed that infections were related to mental ailments. His theory, based on medical discoveries concerning the creation of syphilis, was that mental illness was caused by bodily infections. So one had to remove the infected areas in order to cure the mental illness. He and his staff removed various body parts from patients that they believed may have become infected, which actually led to hundreds of fatalities and mutilations. This includes stomachs, ovaries, testicles, gallbladders, you name it. Often he would carry on with these removals despite not having patients or their family's consent. While he left the hospital in 1930 and died three years later, many of his practices, including the removal of patients' teeth, were continued until 1960. These days, parts of the hospital are still in use, but other areas have been abandoned, and they're terrifying to look at. And finally, Finally, in at number one, Danvers Lunatic Asylum. Danvers, located in Massachusetts, operated not only as an asylum, but also as a prison. Opening in 1878, it was used for mentally unstable criminals, and was known to be incredibly understaffed. By the 1930s, it was reported that patients would often be found dead days later after passing, and that procedures the likes of lobotomies and shock therapy were the norm there. Patients were restrained by straitjackets, and heavy drug use was utilized to keep patients at bay. This caused huge controversy back in the 60s, which eventually led to major budget cuts. To add insult to injury, the location of the Danvers Asylum was also where the Salem Village of the Salem Witch Trials occurred. So yeah, double whammy there. It's also been an inspiration to many fictional asylums, including DC's Arkham Asylum and H.P. Lovecraft's Arkham Sanitarium. It was even the location of the horror film Session 9. Number 5 on this list is Pink Place Market. This would be a really nice place to do your shopping if it wasn't so freaking haunted. Mental Floss says, As one of the most famous public markets in the country, Pike Place Market is known for a lot of things. Fresh coffee, fresher fish, and paranormal activity. The Seattle Times reported on a number of figures who supposedly walk through walls or vanish into thin air. One older gentleman named Frank apparently likes to introduce himself to the living outside of a restaurant at the Alibi Room. Various other spirits also have names, like Princess Angeline, Madame Nora, and the Fat Lady Barber. At one point in the early 1900s, one section of the market was home to a mortuary. Currently operating in the basement of that space is Kell's Irish Restaurant and Pub. Its manager, Patrick McAleese, recalled some eerie instances to the Times, such as a wall mirror inexplicably shattering, only to have the shards fall into a neat pile. You think someone must be pulling your leg, he said, but then you don't see anyone. So it seems that we have a full-on team of ghosts here. 
a small village of characters who are all moving around this mall marketplace in Seattle. Because there are so many of these paranormal entities, it makes it extremely difficult for anyone to get any shopping done without having some type of ghostly interference. You can't seem to get a good coffee here without a strong side of haunting along with it. There have been multiple attempts to rid the area of ghosts, but it just simply won't do. No matter how many experts are brought in here to cleanse the area or to put these spirits at rest, they continue to terrorize the people here. Which is really too bad because from what I've heard, they have some really nice shops in here. Number four on this list is COS. So this is a big store in New York that has quite the haunted and terrifying history to it. Mental Floss says, New Yorkers can brush elbows with a ghost while doing some light shopping in Soho. The legend dates back to 1799 when Guliama Elmore Sons tried to elope with her fellow boarding house tenant Levi Weeks. 11 days later, her body was found at the bottom of the well in Lispinard's Meadows, which is now 129 Spring Street. Since 2014, it's been the site of a COS retail store. Levi was arrested, tried, and acquitted in the first major murder trial in America that was fully recorded by a court stenographer. His attorneys, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. But Sands Ghost is said to roam the area, a warning to other girls who might try to run off with their lovers. Curious shoppers can still see the well in COS, just head to the back of the men's department in the basement. Okay, so I have a few questions with this one. Why, after someone was literally murdered here, do we still have this death well in this store? And also, what is a well doing in a store in the first place? Like, I get that it was the 1800s or whatever, but like, we just kept that thing as time went on. Someone literally died in that thing, and now people are wondering why there are ghosts around this place. Like, no wonder Sans Ghosts is still chilling in this area. Even she is probably wondering why this well is still here. Also, can I just make a comment about ghosts in general? I get that they want to warn us about stuff and all of that, but like, why can't they just leave us a nice note or, I don't know, sit down and have a conversation? Why do they need to freak the hell out of people and just leave people confused as to what they want? Anyways, this place is going to remain haunted for a while until someone deals with that well. I'd conduct your shopping elsewhere if I was you. Number three on this list is the trans Algany Lunatic Asylum. This is a scary masterpiece, folks. Thrillist says, This impressive structure, allegedly the world's second largest hand-cut stone masonry building after the Kremlin, looks like it was designed as the set of a blockbuster thriller. Built around the Civil War era, the asylum was designed to house around 250 patients, but ended up holding more than 2,400, including for a brief period, the infamous Charles Manson. That's the opposite of a celebrity endorsement. Along with severe overcrowding, profound abuse abounded people were locked in cages, lobotomized with ice picks, chained to things, and the combination led to hundreds of deaths and a palpable air of suffering. Apparitions are aplenty, like the still deranged patient Ruth who likes to attack visitors. And since the asylum was also briefly a Civil War military base, uniformed soldier ghosts roam the halls. Thousands have claimed to hear voices telling them to get out. Civil War themed ghost tours, tours of the medical center, forensic buildings and geriatrics buildings, and zombie events and balls fully play up the twisted history on the campus grounds. Now, don't get me wrong, would it be really fun to be part of a zombie event at this place? Yeah, absolutely. But I'm also not trying to get attacked by Ruth, the deranged ghost patient. Whenever people travel to a place like this, there is a risk involved. I personally am not willing to take the risk based on the history that this place has seen. Comment down below if you would. Number two on this list is Danfer's Lunatic Asylum. This asylum hosted a very select group, criminals. Thrillist says, part prison, part asylum, all terror. This gothic monolith opened in 1878 to house mentally unstable criminals. Thanks to the addition of the mentally handicapped, alcoholics, and plain old felons, it became so severely understaffed by the 1930s that patients' deaths were often not discovered until days later, when they were found rotting in some forgotten corner. 
Shock therapy and lobotomies were standard procedures. In fact, some called Danvers the birthplace of a prefrontal lobotomy. But a large cemetery on site said to be haunted by evil spirits suggests these were not always successful. The sinister castle-like building is said to have inspired H.P. Lovecraft's Arkham Sanitarium and so also Batman's Arkham Asylum and was the setting of demon movie Session 9. And as if that weren't enough, Danvers used to be Salem Village. Yeah, of Salem Witch Trials fame. Regular ghosts are one thing, witch ghosts are another one altogether. Think about how few people would have had to work here where a literal patient would die and wouldn't be discovered until days later. And also think about what that would have meant for the actual patients. That means that even if you were still alive, you probably wouldn't be treated or seen by a professional for days at a time. Which also means that you might not eat for days at a time either and be stuck in what I can only assume would have been a cell by yourself for that entire time. This would have been a horrible place to go, even if it was just for criminals. Because of all of this, it is now deeply haunted and a place I highly recommend avoiding. And finally, number one on this list is the Waverly Hills Sanatorium. This is an asylum that I've talked about a few times on this channel before, which speaks to how haunted it actually is. Thrillist says, with an alleged 63,000 deaths taking place inside its walls, this place is up to its eyeballs and spirits, not surprisingly topping lists of America's most haunted spots. Originally built as a tuberculosis hospital in 1910, the building saw many die from the disease, but tales of mistreatment and dubious human experimentation trickled out, and patients left the premises in what was known as the death tunnel or body shoot. Apparitions including Timmy, a boy who likes to play with rubber balls who's been caught on tape, the nurse who hanged herself in room 502, another nurse who fell from the same room's window, and scattered screams and footsteps have all been seen. 63,000 deaths. And here we were thinking that the 9,000 in the other place was bad, here's 63,000 more. Any place that has a death tunnel and a body chute, that should not be a place meant for rehabilitation and seeking help. We are talking about some sick stuff that went on here. I would get into some of the rumors associated with the human experimentation, but I honestly don't think that YouTube would let this video stay up if I did. There are a plethora of ghostly spirits that haunt this place now. Dark spirits that have lost all sense of humanity and are more demon than spirit. This is a spot that must be avoided at all costs. In fifth, we have the Most Holy Trinity Church in New York, built sometime between 1882 and 1885 on land that previously served as a graveyard until 1853. According to local rumors, not all of the bodies residing there were exhumed from the graveyard, and the spirits of those left behind still inhabit the grounds to this day. The church property covers an entire city block, and it is said that there are false closets leading to bricked up doorways, tunnels, and random sub-basements throughout the church and convent. There are also mysterious passageways on the upper levels of the church, where legend says only priests are able to enter. The church's rectory was built in 1872 by its second pastor, Monsignor Michael May, who later passed in his room on the second floor. Priests who live in the rectory have used that space for mainly a guest room ever since, as no one has ever been willing to live in it on an ongoing basis. Guests have experienced lights being switched off and on, hearing strange noises, and the sound of a person walking back and forth while trying to sleep. Phantom footsteps have also been heard on the staircases in the building, and dogs who were once kept as pets in the rectory would stare in a trance light stake down the basement stairs, as well as into the dining room when the building got cold. In 1897, a parish bell ringer named George Stell's life was taken in the vestibule of the church. Though there was a suspect in the case, a former parishioner who would later be executed for an unrelated ending of life, no one was ever convicted of the crime. The red fluids of Mr. Stell's, as well as the red handprint of the killer, is believed to still be on the wall in a stairway leading to the bell tower. George's ghost still roams the church and is believed to be the reason why the bells will ring suddenly, vowing not to leave until his death has been solved. Moving on to our fourth place position, we have the Aquia Church of Stafford, Virginia. While the congregation was established in 1711, the physical parish wasn't built until 1751. It was a gorgeous brick building built on a peaceful hilltop with a two-story crucifix floor plan, which otherwise known as a cruciform, which was considered a rather unusual style for colonial churches. Aquia was built to replace two earlier sites of the Overwharton Parish, which were constructed around 1680. The inside of the church burned down in 1754 and was not rebuilt until 1757. 
It was then shut down from the Revolutionary War until the Civil War due to lack of funding, before reopening as a stable, campsite, and hospital for Union forces. It was during this closure that a young blonde woman was traveling the dark country roads, rural Stafford County, when a group of highwaymen accosted her. This time period was full of exasperated uncertainty from the war, and with it a severe lack of resources, food, and money. Men would wait hidden on the side of roads to steal the valuables from people walking or riding by their hiding spots. She ran from the men to the sanctuary of the church, but was only able to hide for a little while before they broke inside and ended her life. Her body was hidden in the tower, and the men were never caught. It wasn't until after the Revolutionary War ended in 1775, and the church was ready to reopen for services, that what was left of her was discovered. A skeleton with golden blonde hair that was as intact as if she had been freshly slain. The red fluid that spilled on the floor from her death was impossible to remove. Despite using every trick known to man, the stains remained in the tower for well over a hundred years, until during a modern renovation when the redness was covered up by concrete. With the facility still being in use today, members of the church have mentioned hearing footsteps walking around at all hours of the day and will break into a frantic run around the church at night, but no one is there. Noises can be heard in the empty tower, with some saying it sounds like a struggle, others describing a groan, whistle, or even a call for help. Many have also mentioned seeing a transparent woman in the church's windows, on the balcony, or even in the graveyard, dubbing her Blonde Beth after the hair of the skeleton. In the 1900s, brave people would try to stay overnight at the church, but were chased away by what they described as an unfriendly presence. A custodian working in the graveyard saw a ghostly woman's face floating above the graves, while another man saw a woman smiling at him through the balcony windows before she vanished. In the middle of this creepy sandwich, Number three on this list is the Cherry Vale. Mall. This is just a mall that for whatever reason has decided that it wants to be haunted. Mental Floss says, since its opening in 1973, the Cherryvale Mall in Rockford, Illinois has been the site of some spooky vibes. The Rock River Times noted that mall employees reported feeling watched or followed after the venue closed at night. Others have reported that certain stores would be a mess in the morning with clothing scattered or displays knocked over even if the space was cleaned before being locked up. And on an even more unsettling note, some even claimed that bathroom doors were held shut by an unknown force. So basically for no good reason, this mall is just haunted now. Now it's either that or this mall is just regularly hit with burglary. Maybe the things are moved because people have been stealing stuff and then just don't put everything back the way that they found it when they first got there. Or, and this one's a long shot, but some people are just pranking the hell out of this mall and creating the legend of a haunting here for some reason. Like a Scooby-Doo-esque vibe where they're really trying to do something else at the mall and need people to leave it alone because they're scared. I don't know, I'm just trying to think of some reason why this mall would be haunted because there really isn't a good one. Comment down below if you guys know what could be causing this mall to be the way that it is. Number two on this list is the Diamond Center. The Diamond Center is located in Anchorage, Alaska and it's very haunted. Alaska doesn't have that many people that live there. It's the largest state in America and yet it has less than one million residents. Which just makes what they did with this mall so much more disrespectful. A golden rule of thumb is do not build big stuff on top of ancient Native American burial sites. Well guess what? They built the Diamond Mall on an ancient burial ground of Native Alaskans. Sure enough, what happens when you do that? Well, some pretty bad things. This mall is almost impossible to shop in now because of this and honestly rightfully so. You should never be building stuff on this land to begin with, but just think about how big Alaska is and how few people live there. Like guys, we couldn't have just moved the mall a kilometer that way and built it over there. I mean, I think that you have the space for it considering you're freaking Alaska. Ghosts and spirits run rampant here and many visitors and employees have had harrowing experiences with them. Some have even reported being attacked by these spirits and been told that they have to leave. Sadly, these people don't control what the mall does and now that it's been put down, the wealthy people who own it, they don't seem to care about these ghostly appearances. And for Finally, number one on this list is Toys R Us. So I know that Toys R Us isn't necessarily a mall, but to a kid it certainly is, and 
Let me tell you, if you're a child, then do not go to this specific Toys R Us. The one that I'm talking about is located in Sunnyvale, California, and it's very haunted. Mental Floss says, A haunted toy store sounds like a solid horror movie plot, but it's rumored to be a reality in Sunnyvale, California. According to Stranger Dimensions, the legend goes as such. The store was built on property that was formerly a plantation. The plantation's owner, Martin Murphy, hired a preacher named Johnny Johnson. Crazy Johnny, as the preacher was nicknamed, was in love with Murphy's daughter, Elizabeth. Unfortunately, Elizabeth was planning on marrying a lawyer, and as the story has it, Johnny was angrily chopping wood one day and fatally wounded himself by accident. His ghost reportedly wanders the land, now home to the Toys R Us, looking for Elizabeth. The usual objects coming off the shelves and footsteps have been reported, but the best anecdote was of employees once hearing a voice whisper, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away over the intercom system. Imagine hearing that over the intercom. How on earth could you ever show up to your work the next day? Like, that's it guys, I am done. I am fully out of there if that's what's coming on over the intercom. I also want to know, what is this ghost referencing? What is he planning on giving or what's he planning on taking away? Unless he really is just citing the Lord and saying that. Toy stores are supposed to be ghost free. There isn't supposed to be some haunted menace terrorizing the people who come and work here. That isn't the case at the Sunnyvale Toys R Us. And that's why I'd be buying my toys elsewhere if I was you. Number five, Bannock, Montana. Coming up first on our list of abandoned towns that might be home to something sinister is Bannock, Montana. This town is a notable hotspot for paranormal enthusiasts, due in part to featuring on Zach Baggins' Ghost Adventures. And if he was involved, you know it's legitimate. It was founded in 1862, when John White discovered there was gold on Grasshopper Creek and the bells rang and all the prospectors rushed into them hills to strike gold and make it big. After after that fortunate discovery, Bannock became your typical gold rush community in the Wild West. That means a lot of people with missing teeth and big straw hats came in to come swing pickaxes at rocks looking for gold. An onset of prospectors and money meant that two-bit hoodlums and varmints were soon to follow. The roads leading up to Bannock became a dangerous place, where holdups, robberies, and all kinds of high noon trouble became common. It became infamous as one of the most dangerous parts of Montana. The route leading into it had more robberies than any other stagecoach route in the country at the time. And the wildest thing about this already pretty Wild West tale is that the leader of the outlaws that had been raiding the stagecoaches on Bannock was Bannock's own sheriff. That is incredible. That's an M. Night Shyamalan twist. Certainly explains why they were able to get away with it for so long. Now with such a storied and troubled history of violence surrounding the town, is it any wonder that it's speculation that it's haunted? By the late 1860s, Bannock's gold rush began to fade, and it started to lose importance as a mining community to bigger things like Virginia City. While there were still people living in it all the way up until the 1950s, its trade diminished greatly. Less gold, less money, less people, less crime, fortunately enough but less of a community. Eventually, the last few residents were displaced and the town would be converted into a state park. You can visit the decaying town now, kept preserved as if people should live there but don't. In a way, Bannock is much like these lives of all those prospectors and hopefuls cut short tragically, existing now just as a spooky memory of a different time. And if you're looking for more spooky stories, well, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. We've got a little bit of everything that freaks you out. Aliens, cryptids, ghosts, goblins, conspiracies, if it's spooky, we've got a video or two on it. So hit subscribe, make sure you hit that bell, and don't miss a single scream out of us. But hey, do that at the end of this video, okay? I got way more ghost towns coming up for you. Well, four. I got four more ghost towns coming up for you. Number four, Kripyat. You can't really have a video on scary ghost towns without including the most infamous ghost town in history, maybe. It both seems like it's a cop-out to list it and also a mistake to ignore it. It's everybody's favorite irradiated town, Pripyat in Chernobyl. While reading about Chernobyl, I was introduced to the word kenopsia, which I hadn't heard before, meaning the feeling of seeing something that you know is supposed to be bustling and populated, but isn't. And I think there are few places on Earth that match that description quite like the exclusion zone. You look at it, and it seems like everybody literally left in a second, leaving behind their personal belongings, their things. It seems like at any moment, Chernobyl should come back to life, 
but won't. A safety test simulating a station blackout power failure would lead to a cataclysmic fire, leading to radioactive material being blown all over Pripyat and the surrounding areas, making it an inhospitable wasteland. 50,000 people used to live here. Now it's a ghost town. Yeah, that line is from Call of Duty. I did steal that. Now Chernobyl, despite the fact that it is literally an irradiated wasteland straight out of the movies, is an above average popular site for tourists and would-be stalkers who want to explore around the exclusion zone for fun. I kind of understand it. I think I'd want to stand around, look around a bit, take it all in, and then immediately get out of there and go to a doctor. I'm not sure I'd spend too much time there personally. Now, as one might imagine, visiting the zone isn't as simple as walking on in and buying a ticket. For starters, the country is kind of busy right now, so not really the best time. But if you were to go, you're advised strongly to go with a guide or someone who knows the area very well due to how dangerous and unknown everything is out there. Avoid touching anything unnecessary, vegetation, or the wild dogs that roam the streets. They're very cute, but their fur is just a little bit too irradiated for me. You gotta wear boots, a mask, and an outfit that covers as much as possible to avoid any dust. You're asked not to enter buildings without approval, since some of them are so degraded that they could collapse under you at any second like the worst game of Jenga. It's kinda hard to look at stuff of Chernobyl and not feel like a, a pit in your stomach, you know? Looking at what happens when human indifference wreaks unspeakable havoc to the lands around it, poisoning the earth forever, radiating the animals, destroying people's homes and lives, and... Well, this ended on a bit of a bleak note, didn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry, this list of abandoned towns hasn't been more fun. I did try to look if maybe there was like an abandoned circus or like an abandoned Toys R Us that would have been fun to talk about, but it's mostly gonna be irradiated wastelands and places where everybody died. Sorry, sorry. In third place, we're taking a closer look at St. Mary the Virgin, located on the outskirts of Clophill, England. Originally built facing the west sometime around the year 1350, it's believed to have been erected on top of a leper hospital run by monks. I'd like to take a moment to note that it was built in the quote unquote wrong direction, with churches traditionally facing east, the direction from which the sun rises, which is associated with the location of heaven and the return of the Messiah in Christian religion. Altars inside of these holy buildings would face in the eastbound direction for prayers. Some have claimed that because St. Mary the Virgin faces away from God, it thus opens its doors to hell, and ergo responsible for the tale I'm about to tell. The building was abandoned in 1848, when the rector at the time made the decision to have a new church built, instead of expanding the previous one, which was much needed due to the rapidly growing congregation. Old St. Mary's, as was dubbed by the locals, was then primarily used as a mortuary chapel, holding bodies before they were buried in the adjacent cemetery. By the 1950s, St. Mary's had become so run down that it could no longer fulfill that use, with just the outdoor walls and tower remaining. In March 1963, the tomb of an 18th century apothecary's wife was broken into, and the bones were arranged ritualistically in the middle of the church. And once again on Midsummer's Eve of 1969, multiple women's graves were broken into, with bones being removed and rearranged once more. While the specific individuals involved in these acts were never identified, the arrangements found resembled those used in black mass rituals performed by satanic groups at the time. After the first incident in 1963, a rare decision was made to rehollow, or in more simple terms, re-bless the altar that was left in the building, in a failed attempt to protect the building from evil. Later that year, Reverend Harold Colthurst reported stumbling upon a group of men in the building that were in the midst of a mysterious ritual, being quoted as saying that the men were trying to communicate with evil spirits, chanting some sort of mumbo jumbo. They were definitely in league with the devil. Modern day visitors to the now landmark have reported seeing a plethora of ghostly figures during the day and nighttime, faint lights moving about before vanishing mysteriously, along with reports of a chilly and oppressive atmosphere even during warm days. In second place, we're visiting L'Abbé de Mortemer, or Mortimer Abbey. It was originally built in 1134 on land gifted by King Henry I. The stagnant water of the drainage lake, which was dug out by the monks to dry up the marshy land, was called Mortemer, or the Dead Pond, giving the monastery its name. Totally not ominous or anything. The monks constructed what was then one of the largest monasteries in the world on said land. The legend says that after the passing of his only son, King Henry wanted to reform his daughter Matilda and had her locked in a room in the abbey for five years. The anger and hate she felt from being sent away and isolated stained and seeped into the walls of the monastery, cursing it for eternity. After her eventual release, she went on to live until 1167, when it said her spirit returned to Mortimer Abbey to haunt the area as the White Lady. She is said to appear on nights close to a full moon, moaning as she drifts through the now ruins of the monastery. Those that have seen her report that she alternates between wearing black and white gloves. If she appears to you with white gloves on, you're destined for good luck. 
but if she appears with black, you'll be expected to pass within a year. Alas, Matilda is not the only spirit one must worry about if visiting the Abbey. When the monastery was at its peak in the 1500s, a frail and suffering woman was brought to the monks with an illness it was believed that only they could aid. It was revealed that she was possessed by the spirit of a wolf and cursed to become a werewolf for several nights. The monks chained her to a room and conducted multiple exorcisms in an attempt to eradicate the spirit. The monks were able to exorcise the evil wolf spirit or demonic force out of the woman, but it then attached itself to the grounds and walls of the monastery. Several hundred years later in 1884, a man named Roger Sabaro was hunting in the woods nearby when he was attacked by a large werewolf. He shot it multiple times, killing the creature, but when he returned home at dawn, he found the body of his wife bearing wounds matching those he had given the wolf. People say the spirit of Roger's wife and his own heartbroken spirit still wander the area when the moon is full. The abbey was exorcised by the church in 1921, but still remains haunted to this day. And coming in first place, we have the Abbey of the Black Hag, locally known as Monastir Galagduff. Please don't curse me for my pronunciation. St. Catherine's Abbey, or simply as Old Abbey. It's located roughly two miles east of the village of Shanna Golden, in the townland of Old Abbey. Gee, can you tell where it got its name? <laughs> One of the earliest recorded nunneries in Ireland, with its first official record being around 1298, it was built on land donated by John Fitzthomas, and has the typical layout for abbeys of its time, with a dining hall, cells, isolated meditation areas, and other rooms still able to be identified amongst the runes today. During the 15th century, there was a major battle for supremacy in the area between the Earl Fitzgerald and the prestigious Butler family, of which the Earldom of Ormond belonged. It got to such an extent that the local bishop was known to pray for peace between the families at masses. During one of the nightly attacks, Earl Fitzgerald attempted to get his wife to safety, but as he was pulling her onto his horse, an arrow pierced her thigh, shattering the bone and spraying red bodily fluids. As he rode on, the Countess appeared to have succumbed to her injury, leading the Earl to seek sanctuary at St. Catherine's. The heartbroken man was certain his wife had passed, so he swiftly buried her between so he swiftly buried her beneath the altar and continued elsewhere to find safety. As the night went on, the nuns and residents began to hear hair-raising screams and made the decision to rebury the Countess in hopes of bringing her peace. When they dug up the body, they discovered her fingers were broken and her nails had been torn off. The poor woman had been buried alive with a very slow and torturous end of her life. To this day, it is believed that the Countess has been unable to find peace and continues to scream in anguish, waiting for her husband to save her from a fate truly worse than death. Moving slightly ahead in time, we come to the Black Nun herself. Described as one in the order that wasn't content with being humble, helping others over herself, and the servitude to God, she instead craved power. The Hag had her own cell, where she worshipped Satan and performed black magic, becoming a slave to the occult. This was the highest form of blasphemy in the church, and the other nuns in the order fled the abbey while the hag remained in her now house of darkness. To complete her rituals, the black nun would venture into the local community and perform depraved lewd acts and offer sacrifices, with bones of young community members later discovered on the grounds. In modern times, visitors have reported seeing the dark shadowy figure of a nun wandering, the feeling of being constantly watched, and a disembodied hand reaching towards them. It has been reported that flashlights cannot function in the nun's cell and modern batteries drain too quickly to have any sort of rational explanation. McKamey Manor, alrighty, before somebody yells at me, yes, this place does market themselves as a haunted house, or, you know, to quote the founder Russ, a survival horror performance house, and they're currently offering 20 grand to anyone who can survive 10 hours of their games. Granted, if you curse or fail a challenge, $500 gets removed each time. Also, I've had a personal vendetta against them for almost 10 years now, and that's about to come into play. Founder Russ McCammy, a former Navy seaman turned haunted attraction enthusiast, doesn't accept any kind of money for this unique experience. Payment is simply a can or bag of dog food. There is a screening process first. Participants must produce a doctor's note, sign a 40-page waiver, pass a background check and drug test, and be screened via FaceTime. A guide has testified that the 40-page waiver signed by participants lists possible risks, you know, that include having teeth extracted, being tattooed, and having fingernails removed. If I didn't already hate the place enough, 
That does it for me. That's just unnecessary torment. It originally operated in San Diego, but neighbors petitioned to have it run out of the area due to the noise and unsafe attention it brought them and were successful. There's a total of three locations now. Nashville, Tennessee and Huntsville, Alabama are the two that we're going to be talking about though. At the Tennessee location, guests must be 21 or older or, you know, 18 with parental consent, while the Alabama location only allows ages 21 and up. The tour lasts from 8 to 10 hours, but no guest has ever made it all the way through. Now, McCamey originally did not allow safe words for the tour but has since reportedly allowed them, with guests having the option to use a safe word that ends the tour immediately. The house operates year-round, and there is allegedly a waiting list of over 24,000 people. I just want to know why! During the tour, employees of the manor may physically attack patrons, waterboard them, force them to eat and drink unknown substances, have them bound and gagged, and engage in other forms of physical and psychological anguish. I'm forgetting something… oh, don't remind me… oh, right! Participants may also be drugged during their experience. And hey, if that wasn't enough ick for anybody, make sure to remember to smile for the camera while you're enduring this hell. McCamey started filming everything that happened inside the manor as an insurance policy, so he'd have proof of what really happened anytime law enforcement came a knocking. In addition, each contestant's experience is live streamed to a Facebook audience of close to 30,000 people. If that's your idea of entertainment, there's a large archive of footage on the official website. So far, no one's been able to escape, and I'm pretty sure everybody leaves with some sort of imprint on their psyche. So big pass from me. Hey, what's creepier than an abandoned schoolhouse with a truly terrifying history? Eh, it's hard to think of anything. The Den School House is a haunted house attraction set in an actual super spooky haunted house that changes every year, meaning visitors never know what to expect. Imagine a place where the boundary between the living and the dead kind of blurs a little bit, where your heart races and reality morphs into a realm of terror. Nestled in Cincinnati, Ohio, this haunted attraction is not for the faint of heart. The School House derives its chilling name from a grim past. Once an actual schoolhouse in the early 1800s, it turned into a grim tale of horror and disappearances. Students vanished without a trace, their fate shrouded in mystery. Legends claim that the school's janitor, Charlie, harbored a sinister secret in the basement. Today, the dense schoolhouse stands as a spine-tingling haunted attraction, drawing brave souls from far and wide. From the moment you step inside, the atmosphere is thick with dread. Dimly lit hallways echo with the distant cries of restless spirits, and you're enveloped in a world where the line between reality and the supernatural blurs. The dense schoolhouse's sinister reputation stems from its commitment to immersive horror. As you navigate its dark corridors, you'll encounter ghastly apparitions, menacing monsters, and grisly scenes that defy belief. The attention to detail is astonishing, making every room feel like a descent into madness. One of these standout features is the infamous basement, where the malevolent spirit of Charlie is said to dwell. The claustrophobic passages, punctuated by eerie lighting and bone-chilling soundscapes, make it an unforgettable, hair-raising experience. Number 3. Centralia, Pennsylvania Coming up next on this list of spooky ghost towns is going to be Centralia in Pennsylvania. Now, As far as ghost towns go, Centralia has got a bit of a Hollywood bug, serving as the inspiration for the titular town in the 2006 horror flick Silent Hill. Now, as a Silent Hill mega fan, I feel the need to point out the video game version isn't based on this town, but it is mostly based on Kindergarten Cop. Look that up, it's a weird thing, but the school in Silent Hill, school in Kindergarten Cop. I don't know. Now, Centralia, back to this one, was a once flourishing community wrecked by a coal mine fire that destroyed the town, leaving only fog and ash raining over the skies. In 1962, a fire started in a landfill and spread to the coal tunnels that lay deep beneath the city thousands of feet below the surface of the town. Rescue crews tried their best to put out the raging flame, but the flame was too mighty to be quelled and eventually caught a coal seam that's still burning to this day, and the town was abandoned. Windows boarded up, debris left in the roads, and never-ending clouds of smoke and fog circling the cracked roads, really getting that Silent Hill feeling. Now, On paper, Centralia does not exist. The government removed its zip code, offices and buildings have all been abandoned, there's no services whatsoever. If you dial 911 in Centralia, nothing's going to happen. The town has no infrastructure so to speak of. It's a sad story, another disaster upending a town and the life that the residents had. Now, Although the town was evacuated, there are a few clingers who refuse to give up on the life they've known. Perhaps it's rebellion or sheer stubbornness, but there are still a handful of people living in Centralia. The last census said that there were five homes that still had people living in them. Talk about a small town, I bet everybody knows each other. While everyone else fled, these last few loyalists intend to live out the rest of their days in Centralia, refusing to let the town be taken from them. So no demonic entities in Centralia, really just some very tired residents who won't give up the ghost. If you ever visit, 
Make sure to be nice, okay? I feel like they've been through a lot. Number two, Verocia Cypress. Coming up next on our list is going to be Verocia and Cypress. Once a shining playground for the glitzy and glamorous, this paradisal resort in the Mediterranean was a popular spot for the celebrities of yesteryear in the 1970s to get away from it all and put their feet up and stop worrying about the daily stresses of having a lot of money and being a movie star. That kind of lifestyle is taxing. The suburbs enjoyed a thriving tourist economy with the golden sand and beachfront hotels being a force and enticing people to come. Of course, fame is fleeting and nothing in this world lasts forever like celebrity resort towns. In 1974, Turkey would invade Cyprus and occupy the north in a response to a Greek nationalist led coup. So the 15,000 people that lived in Verosha all up and fled the city in terror, leaving everything behind as it stood. Unfortunately, years of political strife and controversies in the area kept Verosha's residents from ever returning to their homes leaving the city to rot in open air and decompose into a wasteland. One look at Verosha and it just seems like a tragic waste, trying to wrap, wrap your head around the money, livelihoods, industry, all just lost forever. It's a very eerie feeling looking at the photos of Verosha, seeing the earth try to take the city back. Buildings crumbling, trees sprouting through the bottom floors of cafes and restaurants. Well, why not just go in, fix the place up a little, you know, sweep up, clean it? Well, decades of neglect have done inconceivable damage to the infrastructure. The city has crumbled and wasted away so much that experts estimate that it would take upwards of 12 billion dollars to make the decrepit city livable once again. So for the time being, it'll probably remain as a time capsule, frozen from better years where things were bright for this forgotten city. Number one, Uridur Songlas. Our final entry for this list today is going to be the somber story of the village of Uridur Songlas, an abandoned town in France. Infamous for being host to one of the worst massacres in French history during the Second World War. It's believed the attack was an act of revenge because of the village's support of the resistance. So as retaliation, German soldiers rounded up 642 residents and killed them and burned the houses to the ground. Some were fired at while others were locked in a church that was burned. The only people from the village who managed to survive the horror were those that played possum and fled out into surrounding forests after the invading soldiers had all left. After the war had ended nearby, there was a new Orador sur Glace built nearby. But the original village, what's left of it at least, was ordered to be left untouched by President Charles de Gaulle, who insisted the village must be left standing as a monument to honor the dead who had been wrongfully taken too early. So not quite a ghost town in the sense that there's stories of hauntings or chills through the night, but haunting in a certain sense, definitely. Number five, Otero County Courthouse, New Mexico. In the quiet corners of Alamogordo, New Mexico, I swear, I tried, I looked that up, lies the Otero County Courthouse, a place where the line between the living and the spectral seems to blur. Those who labor within its walls have stories that chill the very marrow of one's bones. An entity from the, you know, depths of the past, seemingly from the early 1900s, tends to emerge from the shadows. Witnesses have reported sightings of this specter, donned in a timeless suit that echoes an era long past. But it's not just apparitions that haunt this courthouse. It's the inexplicable phenomena that defies the laws of physics. Doors, once left ajar, abruptly close of their own volition. And objects, seemingly devoid of reason, plummet to the ground. Surveillance cameras bore witness to the eerie descent of a donation jar in a bowl on an x-ray machine, casting aside any doubts of, you know, a natural explanation. It went from being, you know, there to and there was nobody there. For the courthouse's, you know, beleaguered employees, such occurrences are far from isolated incidents. They become the unsettling rhythm of daily life. When the donation jar defies gravity's grasp and crashes, echoing in the empty halls, it serves as a reminder that here, the ordinary has become the extraordinary. One tale recounted by a brave employee takes us into the restroom, where the mundane transitions into the uncanny. While standing alone, she felt an invisible hand tugging at her hair, a sensation that defies rational explanation. In that moment, the solitude of the restroom was shattered by an unseen presence, a ghostly interloper, if you will. Maintenance man Kenneth Schaefer, no stranger to the courthouse's peculiarities, speaks of doors that defy logic. They stand ajar, only to slam shut as if guided by an unseen hand. A stroll through the courtroom can send shivers down one's spine, as an unexplainable chill pierces through their very being, as if the air itself bears the weight of restless spirits. The history of the Otero County Courthouse is steeped in the echoes of the past. A modern structure completed in 1956, it stands upon the remnants of an earlier courthouse, 
constructed between 1901 and 1903. But it's the specter of a troubled soul from the 1960s or 70s that lingers, a man who chose to end his own life. His presence, or perhaps his torment, has seeped into the very foundations of that place. In the courthouse, the veil between the corporeal and the ethereal grows very, very thin. Number 4. Monroe County Courthouse in Arkansas The Monroe County Courthouse, you know, a seemingly innocuous edifice, conceals a sinister past that continues to haunt its halls to this day. In the year 1898, the courthouse bore witness to a gruesome racial killing that birthed the malevolent spirits that now reside within. Ghost Eyes, the you know, harbinger of the eerie, divulges stories of mournful cries emanating from its basement, serving as a chilling reminder of that fateful day. What transpired here was a harrowing sequence of events that shook the very foundation of this community. Community. The roots of this macabre tale stretch back to the troubled household of John and Mabel Orr, where domestic discord festered like a dark omen. John, an actor by profession, was rumored to have subjected his wife Mabel to unspeakable cruelty, igniting violent clashes that punctuated their marriage. However, on that fateful August 5th, fate would deliver a gruesome twist. An unknown assailant shattered the um, tranquility of their home, taking John's life in a horrifying manner through the kitchen window. Rumors swirled like malevolent spirits, suggesting Mabel's complicity in her husband's demise, intertwined with the ominous presence of voodoo. As the shadows deepened, Mabel's fate took a sinister turn. Mabel, ensnared by the tendrils of guilt and despair, chose to end her own life, poisoning herself in the bleak confines of the courthouse's basement jail. But the horrors were far from over. Over. Four servants of the Orr family, Mance Castle, Will Sanders, Rilla Weaver, you know, Sanders' mother, and Dennis Rickard, found themselves incarcerated alongside the tormented spirit of Mabel. The abyss of human darkness consumed them as a meticulously organized mob descended upon the jail, snatching these souls from their mortal coil on August 9th. The maid, Susie Jacobs, also met her gruesome end at the hands of this merciless assembly. The Encyclopedia of Arkansas History and Culture recounts the grim spectacle of Mabel's lifeless form, put on grisly display within the courthouse, serving as a grim Grim testament that she had not escaped her tormentors. The courthouse, once a symbol of justice, now stands as a malevolent sentinel, guarding the secrets of that gruesome summer. But what truly sets the Dent Schoolhouse apart is the dedication of its performers. The actors are masters of their craft, immersing visitors in a chilling narrative that unfolds with each step. They blur the line between fiction and reality, leaving you questioning what's lurking in the shadows, which means job well done. For those who dare to enter, the schoolhouse offers an unforgettable journey into the macabre. It's a place where you might disappear into a world of terror if only for a night. Kind of like how those students disappeared way back in the day. As you emerge from its haunted halls, your heart pounding and you know, your nerves kind of frayed, you realize that some mysteries are best left unsolved. That is, if you make it out. Penhurst Asylum. So this asylum is a chilling relic of the past tucked away in Spring City, Pennsylvania, and it beckons the brave and the curious alike. Its ominous history, shrouded in mystery and despair, makes it quite the haunting destination for those willing to, you know, take a little peek around its eerie corridors. Once a state school for the mentally and physically disabled, Penhurst's dark past is a tale of neglect and suffering. Not unusual, but still... <clears throat> Stories of mistreatment and torment linger like lingering echoes in its decaying halls. So the place was shuttered in the 80s, which is all too late in my opinion. But the scars it left behind have given birth to something altogether different. Today, Penhurst Asylum stands as a nightmarish playground for those seeking a brush with the supernatural. From the moment you step onto its grim grounds, you're enveloped in an atmosphere of dread. The abandoned buildings loom, their windows like vacant eyes watching your every move. Inside the haunting begins. It's a maze of twisted passages, each more unsettling than the last. The flickering lights cast eerie shadows on peeling wallpaper and rusted beds, remnants of the institution's grim history. The air is heavy with the weight of the past, and the feeling of being watched is inescapable. But it's um not just the decaying infrastructure that chills the bones at this place. The asylum boasts a family of actors who bring the horrors of its past to life. They portray the former staff and patients, their performances teetering on the edge of reality and fiction. You'll feel their anguish and torment, blurring the lines between history and horror. Well, that is if you make it out. One of these standout features is the infamous Mayflower Hall, known for its particularly intense paranormal activity. Here, visitors have reported unexplained phenomena, ranging from whispers, shadowy figures, to unrelenting cold spots. Ooh, bother. It's a place where the veil between this world and the next seems disturbingly thin. As you navigate the nightmarish landscape, it's pretty easy to get lost in its dark history. The horrors you encounter are a reminder of the institution's grim past, where people were forgotten and suffering was the norm. Some say that those who disappear into Penhurst may never truly leave. Their spirits forever bound to its haunted halls. In the end, it stands as a chilling testament to the horrors of the past and the terrors of the unknown. 
Eloise Psychiatric Hospital was a large complex located in Westland, Michigan that operated from 1839 to early 1982. It started out as a poorhouse and farm and eventually developed into an asylum, sanatorium, and hospital. It's had a lot of names over the years, so bear with me here. In 1832, it was called the Wayne County Poorhouse. In 1872, it was the Wayne County Alms House. Well, in 1886, it was referred to simply as the Wayne County House. In 1913, there were three divisions. The Eloise Hospital, which housed, you know, the mental hospital. The Eloise Infirmary, or the Poor House. And the Eloise Sanatorium, which housed patients with tuberculosis. And all three were collectively called Eloise. Oh, that's not the end of the name changes. In 1945, it was named Wayne County General Hospital and Infirmary at Eloise, Michigan. Which, you know, bit of a mouthful. By 1974, it had two divisions, separating the Wayne County Psychiatric Hospital from the General Hospital. By 1979, it was officially called Wayne County General Hospital, with the Psychiatric Division closing in 82. In its heyday, Eloise was made up of 78 buildings on 902 acres, with 10,000 patients, along with 2,000 staff, serving as the largest psychiatric facility in the United States. Only the firehouse, power plant, commissary, and D buildings still stand as of right now, as well as the cemetery. It had some good things back in the day, you know, housing the first kidney dialysis unit in the entire state of Michigan, and pioneering the use of music therapy, but they also used, you know, hydrotherapy, shock therapy, oh, and insulin therapy to treat patients. As the years went on, the institution grew larger and larger, which was a reflection in the increases of population in the area. From only like 35 residents in 1989, the complex grew to about 10,000 residents at its peak during the Great Depression. Now to talk about the ghosties. You know, my favorite part. Numerous typical poltergeist activities have been witnessed within the complex, with doors slamming and medical carts and tables being overturned. Generally speaking, there are shadow figures that seemingly drip from the ceilings and ooze from the walls of this place, becoming part of the building itself until they are one and the same. Two ghostly little ones have been seen running the paint peeling walls of the hallways, turning a corner only to disappear. It's assumed they were inmates at the time Eloise was a poorhouse, where orphans often lived until they were adopted out or um, passed away. Possibly they died in their youth, or maybe they just relive their lives now without the fear that they had when they were alive. You know, carelessly playing games in a kind of uh, purgatory. Now there's a mysterious lady that appears as a white vapor and has been seen manifesting within one of the buildings that still stand, and her voice has been recorded as she whispers, Help! Another ghost is that of a doctor said to prowl the halls of the crumbling facility, and even in the afterlife, he searches for an unfortunate patient to practice his scientific methods. Some have reported seeing a specter drenched in water, possibly a reminder of when hydrotherapy was coming into popularity. Other times, the phantasm is seen wearing a smock stained in red, presumably from a lobotomy. Yikes! Possibly the doctor lingers, tormented by the ghosts of the patients upon whom he practiced. Nowadays, this building is home to two different escape rooms, which is super duper fun. So if you feel like risking the ghost's wrath, that's on you. Good luck making it out. Number one, the Winchester Mystery House. So the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California is a labyrinth masterpiece of incredible architecture and paranormal intrigue. Its story begins with Sarah Winchester, the widow of the inventor of the famous Winchester rifle. Legend has it that she believed the spirits of those killed by the rifle were haunting her, and her response was to embark on an unceasing construction project that lasted for decades. The house itself is a bewildering marvel, a maze of staircases that lead to nowhere, doors that open into walls, and windows that peer into adjacent rooms. Its design is an enigma, but the hallways doubling back on themselves and secret passages hidden behind bookshelves. But what makes the Winchester Mystery House truly spine-chilling are the rumors of hauntings. Visitors have reported ghostly apparitions, eerie footsteps, and unexplained cold spots. The layout adds to the unease, as one can easily become disoriented within its winding corridors. One of the most famous rooms in the mansion is the seance room, where Sarah herself is said to have communicated with the spirits. It's a place of both fascination and fear, with its ornate details and otherworldly purpose. Over the years, countless tales of visitors and employees experiencing unexplained phenomena at the house have added to its mystique. Some believe that Sarah's quest to appease vengeful spirits has left a lasting imprint on the mansion, making it a hotbed of paranormal activity. It's a place where the boundary between the living and the dead blurs. The Winchester Mystery House is a testament to the enduring power of mystery and the human fascination with the supernatural. After a two-year hiatus from hosting Halloween events, they've been heavily promoting their latest attraction in time for this spooky season. And with a title like Unhinged Housewarming, it promises to be their scariest yet. In fifth place, we have Mount Athos in Greece. Mount Athos is a mountain and peninsula in the northeastern Greece and is an important center of Eastern Orthodox monasticism, which has been occupied for more than a millennium by Russian Orthodox monks. I promise I try with pronouncing the long-standing gender ban on this ancient mountain doesn't apply to just women, but also includes many female domestic animals. So uh, how the heck has the animal population not died out yet? Also, uh, more importantly, who the heck has the job of wandering around and policing animal genitalia? I genuinely want to know how that's like policed, because in my brain, it's currently playing a very Looney Tunes skit, and I'm 
cackling, as you can see. Does someone bring in fresh creatures from the mainland to help with the population? Sure, in the Jurassic Park universe, all the dinosaurs are female, but that's entirely different because they're still able to like procreate under monitoring and careful breeding, but um, males don't have the same nesting organs to make this a reality. Okay, fine, I'll get it back on topic, but if anyone knows anything about how the heck this could be achieved, please let me know in the comments. Commonly known amongst Greeks as the Holy Mountain, the self-governed Mount Athos, which encompasses both the mountain and a peninsula in Macedonia, is accessible only via ferry and only to men with a special permit. If you want to visit the mount, the first step is to submit a copy of your passport to the Mount Athos Pilgrims Bureau. Each day, 100 Orthodox and 10 non-Orthodox male pilgrims are admitted for a three-night stay in one of the peninsula's 20 monasteries. The centuries-old belief maintains that the presence of females inhibits their path to the spiritual enlightenment of the monks living there, amongst its, you know, once again, 20 monasteries, and also to ensure celibacy, which I would understand if it weren't also for the ban on female animals. For crying out loud, folks, if you take a vow of celibacy, your willpower should be enough, or maybe... It ain't for you if you can't control yourself around a woman. I'm gonna start screeching about sexist dress codes for the same reasons if I don't watch myself. Fun fact, over the years, a handful of women have been successful in sneaking onto Mount Athos's forbidden to female shores, including a French writer who reportedly underwent a double mastectomy in order to disguise herself as a monk in the 1920s, and more recently, four Moldovan women who illegally entered Greece and accidentally ended up there. Backtracking really quickly, it was first invaded in 382 by the Placencia, the daughter of the Emperor Theodosius. Greek journalist Malvina Kerali was the latest woman to break the ban and enter onto the territory of Mount Athos, when, as she claims, she entered the sanctuary dressed as a man in the 1990s. Atta girls. In fourth place, we have the Galaxy Water Park in Bavaria. Alrighty, so this might not be as terrifying as some of the other places on this list in the, you know, I fear for my life or men are doing scary things type of way, but just stay with me here. One of Europe's largest and most popular water parks, which is part of the sprawling Therm Erding sauna complex near Munich, banned women from one of its high-speed slides because owners determined it to be causing, um, intimate injuries. According to a park official, at least six women suffered injury to their genital area on the extreme phase slide, in which participants can reportedly hit speeds up to 45 miles per hour. Pardon me while I pick my jaw up off the floor. For starters, as someone with the genitalia referred to, I'm wondering how the heck the other um, genitalia, which to my knowledge is more sensitive upon impact, surviving, you know, without being in the same amount of pain or worse. Come on, one bad soccer ball to the collapsible schlong and nuts and, uh, down goes the human. Whereas for those who possess the genitalia that uh, isn't that, I can speak for experience that I can withstand that and uh, not fall to my knees. So what kind of targeted water pressure hell does this slide have that people are getting injured from? Now, a park spokesman told an English language newspaper that it was working on developing a special bodysuit for women to prevent such mishaps in the future. According to a gynecological association that was referenced in the newspaper, however, there was no medical condition other than pregnancy that should prevent women from using such a slide. Yeah, I'm giving this water park some serious side eye. Honestly, is there not some kind of overall health and safety thing that can come into play to fix this nonsense? Number three, Navajo County Courthouse in Arizona. Within the haunted tales of American courthouses, the old Navajo County Courthouse emerges as a sinister enigma, where the spirit of George Smiley is said to linger. Smiley's grim fate was sealed when he faced a death sentence for the killing of a railroad foreman, a crime that would shroud the courthouse in an unsettling legacy. Sheriff Frank Watron's macabre sense of humor cast an eerie pall over Smiley's impending execution. He dispatched gilded invitations for the hanging, a grotesque spectacle spectacle set for November 11th of 1899. But this twisted jazz proved too much for the sensibilities of President McKinley and Governor Nathan Murphy, who swiftly reprimanded Watron, postponing the execution. In response, the sheriff issued another set of invitations, this time veiled in mournful language and adorned with a black border, signaling the ultimate demise of George Smiley on January 8th of 1900. But, mm, the story doesn't end with Smiley's execution. According to a column in The Examiner, the old courthouse now houses the local historical society, but its halls are far from quiet. Eerie noises reverberate throughout the building, and objects move of their own accord, as if guided by unseen hands. It is here that these spectral roommates, including George Smiley and Sheriff Watron himself, are said to coexist in the realm of the beyond, their presence an enduring enigma. Far from the dusty trails of Navajo County, the Lincoln County Courthouse in Wiscasset, Maine, harbors its uh, own spectral mysteries. In 2011, the courthouse was thrown into a state of disquiet when a motion-sensitive security camera captured eerie footage. County Commissioner Sheridan Bond, armed with a magnifying glass, scrutinized a still frame from the recording, believing he could see a spectral visage within the mysterious entity. Others, although uncertain about the existence of a face, agreed that the camera unequivocally captured something that we can't explain. Oh, the eerie occurrences doesn't end there. That, that's way too easy. Workers in the district attorney's office have reported sightings of a shadowy figure, manifesting in the late afternoon and early evening, casting a chilling pall over the courthouse. WC 
KCSH, the local station, embarked on a quest to, you know, unveil the identity of the entity haunting the courthouse. However, their efforts yielded no definitive answers. The enigma persists, shrouded in the mists of time and history. The courthouse itself, with its origins dating back to 1824, has borne witness to a multitude of souls, some incarcerated, others executed, their stories etched into the very walls of the building. Number 2. Desha County Courthouse in Arkansas So, nestled in the heart of Arkansas City, this courthouse holds a spectral secret that has intrigued ghost hunters and courthouse workers alike. Here, the haunting presence of a ghost known as Willard weaves its haunting tapestry throughout the building, defying the bounds of human logic. Local legend intertwines with the supernatural in a tale that centers around the courthouse's clock tower. An unsettling belief holds that the clock, perched high in its tower, has been cursed since the turn of the 20th century. The curse, it is said, was cast by a condemned man who met his grisly end on the courthouse lawn. The alleged arson of a string of hotels, a charge he vehemently denied. In a curious twist, County Judge Mark McElroy once made a campaign promise to mend the clock, as reported by, you know, the local gazette. However, the appointed clock technician, tasked with repairing the timepiece, dispelled the supernatural aura surrounding it. In his words, back in the old days, they probably did hang somebody out there on the front of the courthouse, or on the steps of the courthouse, or up in the tower of the courthouse, or whatever. I don't dispute that one bit, and the guy may have cursed them on the clock, but that's not the problem with the clock. It's just an old clock, and it needs uh, tender love and care. All of them are that way. All right, pal. The cryptic saga of the county courthouse embodies the confluence of folklore, history, and the supernatural. Willard's ghostly presence lingers, a reminder that even in the realm of the mundane, the boundaries between fact and legend can blur. Whether it's a cursed clock or the echoes of a tragic past, the courthouse stands as a testament to the enduring mysteries that shroud these haunted halls. Number 1. Mitchell Courthouse in Baltimore In the corridors of the Clarence M. Mitchell Jr. Courthouse, you know, nestled in Baltimore, Maryland, a spectral presence is said to romance, you know, a spectral presence is said to roam an apparition of historical significance. Supreme Court Justice Roger B. Taney, infamous for the polarizing, you know, Dred Scott decision, is believed to be the source of the unexplained phenomena that uh, has unnerved those who tread upon this hallowed legal ground. Attorney Adam Sean Cohen's harrowing experience within these haunted walls serves as a testament to the otherworldly ambiance that permeates the courthouse. So during a court proceeding, Cohen was gripped by an inexplicable dread, likening the sensation to the frigid aura of a grocery store's frozen food section, where the coldness surrounds you while warmth beckons from within. Overwhelmed by this uncanny sensation, Cohen abruptly left the courtroom, a uh, you know decision unimaginable in normal circumstances, as judges are typically treated with the utmost, you know, respect. As judges are typically treated with the utmost respect. Circuit Judge Wanda Keys Heard, you know, presiding over the proceedings, showed a remarkable understanding of Cohen's abrupt exit. She herself believes that the courthouse is under the uh, spectral watch of justice, you know, that uh, has passed, whose name I don't want to bugger up again. This belief is underscored by the presence of, you know, the name etched upon the dome of the courthouse, a chilling reminder of the historical legacy that lingers. Heard, a descendant of those who endured the dark days of, you know, bad things, humorously speculated that um, this guy might harbor some reservations about her role in the legal proceedings. However, a curious twist emerges when the courthouse's historian sheds light on the situation. While this ghostly presence is rumored to haunt the courthouse, historical records reveal a peculiar detail. The esteemed justice was never actually inside the courthouse during his lifetime. The courthouse itself was constructed in 900, long after this man's passing in 1864. Instead, it was a neighboring building, now demolished, where this um, presence resided, you know, a location that has seemingly left quite the mark on the surrounding area. The spectral enigma of the courthouse serves as a chilling reminder that history has a peculiar way of transcending time and place. This Justice's ghostly presence, though physically distant from the courthouse itself, continues to cast its ethereal shadow over the legal proceedings that unfold within its walls. It's a testament to the enduring influence of the past, one that defies the constraints of time and logic, leaving those who dare to enter these haunted halls with an unsettling sense of history's weight. Number 5. Bangar Fort now, if you Google Bangar Fort, if you're planning a trip up there anytime soon, almost every result will give you back something like India's most notorious or India's most haunted. So maybe that should give you a bit of a sense as to what's going on here. It's uh, bad news. In fact, the place is said to be so filled to bursting with malevolent spirits that the Indian government actually restricts tourists from visiting after sunset for fear of spiritual danger. Let's take a look at the history of the Bangar Fort, one of the most notorious haunted places in India if the search engine is anything to go by. The fort was first built in the 17th century and according to local legends, a religious ascetic lived nearby to the fort and insisted that any house built near the fort shouldn't be taller than its own house. Not sure why, but he just didn't want to be upstaged, I guess. If the shadow of any house fell on his own, he would destroy the fort, he threatened. When columns were added to the fort that casted a shadow, the fort was destroyed and abandoned seemingly overnight. 
Now a variant of this legend suggests that a priest who practiced black magic and was a practitioner of the occult was in love with a little princess who lived in the fort. He offered her a love elixir and when she refused his proposal he cursed the entire village condemning it to be damned by the spirits for eternity. Locals claim that walking by the Bangar fort you can hear women screaming and crying from within at night and strange otherworldly music can be heard playing seemingly from nowhere. Other residents claim claim that they see shadowy wisps or ethereal lights coming out of the fort's structure alongside strange smells? What does a ghost smell like, I wonder? You know what? Don't let me know. That's maybe one that's better left not knowing. The reason for the ban after sunset is because local legends say that any person who enters the fort during the night will never be seen again and will become one of the spirits trapped inside. So maybe just stay within the guidelines and follow the signs just this once. And if you're looking for more videos about haunted hot spots, alien sightings, cryptids, creepy crawlies, and basically just about anything scary under the sun and above it, well, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. So click on through, subscribe, stay scared, and don't miss a single scream. But do that after you finish watching this video, okay? We worked hardish on it. Number 4, Tunnel 33. Shimla is said to be one of the most beautiful cities in the entire country of India and happens to also be home to some of the more haunted hot spots. Now this one in particular might not be as scary as some of the other ones in this list. I thought maybe I'd give you a little break before we really got into it. But this ghost has been described as a lot friendlier than your average spirit. More of a Casper, if you will. Tunnel 33 is the longest tunnel in the Kalka Shimla railway track built in the late 18th century in 1898. British railway engineer Colonel Balrog was the man in charge of constructing the project. Colonel Balrog, I'm pretty sure he was a Street Fighter character. Colonel Balrog was given a thin deadline and he failed to meet expectations for the tunnel, leading to him being humiliated in his career after the British government was understandably pretty upset with him. Distraught, completely despondent, he ended up taking his own life and was buried near the incomplete tunnel on the railroad tracks where his spirit has remained ever since. Residents report seeing apparitions of the good Colonel through the tunnel, sometimes saying they see him standing, admiring his work, riding his horse, or if you really believe some of the more out there stories, he's even been seen talking to tourists and locals as they pass through, asking questions about his tunnel and if the project is going well and if they're meeting deadlines. The poor guy is still so focused on his work all these years later. Take a break, man, for us, please. A phantasmal 15. You've earned it. There's something very sad about a ghost who's stuck on the land he worked on, unable to move on. He's not interested in haunting or scaring anyone, but just doomed to check in on a project he never got to see completed. If you ever visit the Accursed Tunnel, and if you happen to see the Colonel, tell him thank you. Won't you? For, for me, okay? Tell him that the tunnel looks great and he did a good job. I'm sure he'd appreciate it. In third place, we have Saudi Arabia. If you're a solo female traveler looking to visit Saudi Arabia as a tourist, you'll have an easier time booking a trip to Mars. As of 2010, tourist visas to Saudi Arabia don't exist, and visas for business and to visit family are notoriously difficult for women to obtain. On top of that, women who travel to the country normally must be accompanied by a male relative in order to be granted entry. And even though some things have lightened over the years, Saudi Arabia isn't exactly a welcoming destination for women. Women just needing a man or government permission to do just about anything, Saudi Arabian women aren't even allowed to drive. Now, as a gal who watches WWE, this is something I've noticed before. When they started hosting events in Saudi Arabia back in 2014, women were not allowed to wrestle on those shows, not until 2019. At that first event in 2019, Lacey Evans, a wrestler who usually competes in a, like, two-piece, very revealing outfit, wore a full black bodysuit instead of her normal ring attire, with a very large baggy shirt over top due to the country's conservative dress policy. This became the norm for women's matches until 2021, when women were allowed to customize their bodysuits but still had to wear the baggy shirts. Crown Jewel of 2021 was also the first show to feature more than one women's match. It was only in 2022 when women were able to ditch the baggy shirts, but to this day still have to wear the one-piece outfits. Was this a long way to compare the portrayal of women and their rights in North America versus Saudi Arabia? Yes. But was it also the easiest and most factual way I knew how? Also yes. In second place we have the sacred Japanese island Okinoshima. Okinoshima is an island 60 kilometers off of the coast of Kyushu in the Genkai Sea. I swear I looked up how to pronounce these things so if I get it wrong, blame the interwebs. But with its remote location, steep cliffs, primeval forests, and almost no infrastructure other than a simple port, it doesn't exactly look like the most welcoming place at first glance. But the island apparently has a lot going for it, even though the only official inhabitant of Okinoshima is a single Shinto priest tending to the island's shrine, which is alternatively 
collectively known as Okitsugu, part of the Munakata Taisha Grand Shrine, complex spread across a total of two islands and the Kyushu mainland. Pardon me, it's a series of priests who spend 10 day intervals on the almost deserted island, but always one at a time. They have two jobs, hey, just like most of us in this economy. One is to chant prayers to Takorohime, daughter of the sun goddess Amaterasu, one of the most important deities in the entire Shinto pantheon. The second is to make sure that no woman ever steps foot on the island. Not to sound like a broken record, but I've worked less stupid jobs, and that's saying something. I'm a workaholic performer, so when I say my resume is as long as my arm, me calling a job stupid means something. Women are strictly prohibited from landing on Okinoshima, and the actual cause of which isn't fully understood. Some say it's because of women's links to menstrual fluid, which is considered impure by some Shinto schools of thought. Other theories say that women aren't allowed on Okinoshima to protect them as some Japanese goddesses have been known to be distrustful of potential rivals. In the past, artists specializing in image of Benzaiten, the syncretic Japanese goddess of beauty, music, and love, were actually advised not to marry so as to not make the deity jealous about them having another woman in their lives. But there are are no such stories about Tagorohimi, and allegedly she isn't even the most important deity in the neighborhood. The whole of Okinoshima is. So all you've got is the impurity of a natural function and maybe offending a goddess? And by my research, no one is 100% sure that's accurate? Alrighty, moving on before I start saying words in French that will for sure anger the interweb gods. Apparently in the Shinto religion, it's not uncommon for land masses to be worshipped as gods, which is actually the case with the island of Mayahima, home to the UNESCO World Heritage Site of the Itsukushima Shrine, which is why the complex's main shrine and Tori Gate were constructed on the shore and on the water instead of deeper on the island. When it comes to women, however, they are absolutely allowed on that one. Some Shinto sites, yes, do exclude female visitors, such as Mount Omin or Mount Sanjo in the Narata prefecture. But here's the kicker. They at least have historic records proving that the practice goes back centuries. With Okinoshima, no one really knows how the no women allowed rule started. The Okitsumiya shrine dates back to around the 17th century, but religious rites were performed on Okinoshima as far back as the 4th century. In all that time, no written account about women being banned from the island has surfaced. In fact, the whole idea sounds contrary to the origins of Okinoshima as a deity. The best available evidence says that the island was a seafaring guidepost on a trading route to Korea, as well as a harbor for fisherfolk venturing far out into the sea. To ensure safe sea passages through dangerous waters, these mariners would stop at Okinoshima and make offerings of mirrors, bronze dragon ornaments, food, and much more. Oh, I'm not done yet! According to interviews conducted by Dr. Lindsay E. DeWitt from the University of California, it was common for centuries for male-female fishing couples to travel to the island together to make offerings. It's not clear when that changed, but it did. Starting around the Edo period, so between 1603 to 1868, Okinoshima became off love to women. That's a smidge too recent in history, ergo me making a face right now. A little bit suspicious. Fun fact, there used to be a tradition of allowing 200 men onto the island on May 27th every year, but only after they stripped naked and underwent a sacred rite of ablution that they could never ever ever talk about in detail whatever they saw on that day. But after Okinoshima became Japan's 21st UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2017, the ceremony was cancelled indefinitely. Fascinating sidebar. During that annual event, every man admitted to Okinoshima was forbidden from removing anything from the island. I'm talking no pebbles or talking about what they saw or experienced there. Here's the fun historical thing though. Huge archaeological expeditions in the past have removed much more than pebbles from the island. Currently the Munakata Taisha Shrine Museum in Kyushu houses 80,000 precious artifacts, including bronze mirrors, beads, and shards of glass, presumably brought to Japan by way of the distant Silk Road, which were all taken from Okinoshima. And yet, the island is still standing, so maybe the gods would also be fine with female visitors? Just saying. In first place, we have the La Rinconda Gold Mine. Ah, gold mines. Reminds me of home. I grew up in a gold mining town, so it's part of my history. Heck, my preference for silver jewelry over gold quite often vexes my dad. So sadly, while women in my town were, you know, on equal footing with the men, this isn't going to be as lovely of a tale. The La Rinconada gold mine in Peru is both the highest elevated settlement on the planet at 16,732 feet and perhaps the most exploitative place in the world. People come to this remote hellhole to work for the corporation that owns the mine for zero pay. At the end of their 30-day shift, they can take home as much raw ore as they can carry, but here's the catch. They don't know if there's actually any gold in the ore. Not gonna lie, I doubted that statement at first, so I actually called up my dad and he confirmed it for me. It's all certainly illegal, but no one's doing anything about it. The town the mine is a part of has zero sanitation, no plumbing, most of the trash is burned in the streets, and city services simply don't exist. But the most bizarre aspect of this brutal, unforgiving town is the fact that women aren't allowed to enter the mines, all because of superstitions. All they're allowed to do is pan for gold in the wastewaters coming off the mountain. And hey, knowing what we know now, about spotted 
golden ore, they might be getting the better part of this deal. Worse than being barred from the only source of potential income in the area is the fact that many women are exploited at the mine. If panning for gold fails them, many women are forced into um, schmex work including the underage folks. Okay, no trips to Peru anytime soon. Noted. Number five on this list is the Leap Castle. The Leap Castle is located in Ireland and it's just a setting for a movie waiting to happen. CN Traveler says, built somewhere between the 13th and late 15th century, this Irish castle has seen more gruesome deaths than a Game of Thrones wedding. As legend has it, during a struggle for power within the O'Carroll clan, which had a fondness for poisoning dinner guests, by the way, one brother plunged a sword into another, a priest, as he was holding mass in the castle's chapel. The room is now called the Bloody Chapel, and the priest is said to haunt the church at night. And the horror doesn't end there. During castle renovations in the early 1900s, workmen found a secret dungeon in the Bloody Chapel with so many human skeletons they filled three cartloads when they hauled away. The dungeon was designed so that prisoners would fall through a trap door, have their lungs punctured by wooded spikes on the ground, and die a slow, horrific death within earshot of the sinister clan members above. Man, people really were nuts back then. Like, think about the dude who designed that kill chamber. Putting down all the spikes, arranging them in such a fashion that they wouldn't kill somebody right away, but give them just enough time to feel the sheer agony of it all and hear a bunch of their enemies having dinner above them. Obviously, because of all of this, this castle is right up there as being one of the most haunted in the world. The ghosts of those who died in this chamber are said to haunt those who stop by. Their spirits are filled with rage and anger, and they want to take it out on all the people who come here. Like, this sucks, because it would be kind of interesting to tour this castle, but at the same point, I don't know if I even blame these guys. Like if I had to die like that, then I feel as if I'd be a pretty bitter ghost about things as well. Number four on this list is the Huska Castle. This is right up there as being a castle to hell, if you ask me. CN Traveler says, located about an hour north of Prague, Huska Castle has no fortifications, no kitchen, and had no occupants when it was built. It does, however, have something within its walls that no other castle in the world has, a large hole in the ground that many consider to be the gateway to hell. Huska was strategically built over the hole, which is fabled to be bottomless, to seal up the gateway and keep demonic creatures from entering our world. The demons are said to be trapped in the walls of the lower level. Here's where the story gets really creepy though. Before sealing it off, nearby prisoners were granted pardons if they would agree to be lowered into the hole by a rope and report back what they saw. When the first prisoner was lowered, he started screaming after a few seconds. When he was raised back up, the story goes, he appeared to have aged 30 years. So there is literally a gateway to hell here in this castle. That is so freaking cool and at the same point, so freaking scary. Think about how many demons and ghouls must be running around this place all the time. The devil, for all we know, might claim this castle as his own and show up here regularly. And then there's the whole story with the prisoner. How in the hell did that happen? He gets lowered down and then seconds later raised back up only to be 30 years older? I wonder if this indicates to us that time moves a lot faster in hell. Or maybe he lived 30 entire years in hell in the short time that it took us to reel him back up. Can you imagine 30 years in hell just dangling by a rope? That would be, well, that would be hell. Number three, Remoji Film City. Remoji Film City is one of the biggest film sets in the country. In fact, it's actually one of the largest film complexes in the entire world. I mean, it's a film city. How many other film cities are there really? It's a big attraction for movie lovers who come the world over to see its extravagant displays and exhibits, but also entices paranormal hunters looking for proof of the other world. And there's a little something for everyone here, you know? It's a real family place. So where does the haunting come from? Do the ghosts just love the silver screen? Well, Remoji Film City was allegedly built on an old Nizam battleground. The Nizam of Hyderabad was the ruling caste of the area in the 18th century. Now, if these stories are true and it is built on an old battlefield, then it makes sense that there would be a good amount of lingering evil and restless spirits trapped in the soil that haven't moved on. Dying violently tends to make ghosts. Guests of the film city claim that while visiting, lights will flicker and turn on and off at random. 
Now that could be bad wiring, but it also could be troublesome spirits. Where things get kind of spooky is the reports of crew members on film sets getting injured under mysterious circumstances. Equipment malfunctioning or outright being destroyed in front of people's very eyes. And these are some of the more common reports of things happening on the cursed set. Women in particular have felt targeted by the ghosts or spirits in the Ramoji film city. Actresses have claimed that they felt like they were being watched in their green rooms or even feeling a supernatural tugging at their clothes during filming. Now I'm sure they make all kinds of genres of movie at the Ramoji film city, but if you want my professional advice, I think they should definitely consider filming a horror movie there. It sounds like they would save a ton on the special effects budget or maybe they could make a documentary. Do you need to pay a ghost? If you're gonna have a ghost in a movie, do ghosts still have the same workers' rights? Somebody look into that for me. Number two, the Charleville Mansion. We're headed back to Shimla for this next one. It sounds like if you're booking a trip to India to take in the sights and the spirits, Shimla is the number one place to be. Beautiful and filled with ghosts. Once you're done checking out the tunnel, take a trip to the Charleville Mansion, said to be the home to an old poltergeist. It's a century old abandoned fort built during the British rule, and its first owner was a British officer who whose name has seemingly been lost to time. Probably something like Wilford Brimley, no, that's a different guy. When the officer and his wife moved into the mansion in 1913, they were unaware of the rumors surrounding it. They just thought they were getting a great deal on rent. A previous owner had already fled the property because of the hauntings that had taken place. They said that there was a ghostly figure that would slowly apparate in the middle of the night and would smash objects and throw them around the house. Now despite this house being haunted, the officer himself didn't personally believe in ghosts. He wanted to test this theory of whether or not there was a poltergeist in his home and so he locked all of the doors in his house and waited. Just sat there twiddling his thumbs, tapping his feet, waiting for a ghost to approach. Well, lo and behold, after locking all the doors, he heard a crash upstairs and ran upstairs, opened the door and found that this one room had all of the furniture and all of the mirrors just utterly demolished. I think he moved out the same week. They say he moved out shortly after, but I can't even imagine he finished packing his bags. Now the next owner was one Victor Bailey, an assistant secretary working on the railway construction at the time. And I gotta say, there must be some really bad vibes at the Shimla Railway if two entries on this list involve it. Anyway, the Baileys moved into the mansion, and at first it seemed like a great deal. Beautiful mansion secluded away from the rest of the world. Until one day at a dinner party, one of their guests reported that he was talking to a lovely English gentleman. Victor Bailey was a bit confused, and when he went back to go introduce himself to this guest, he watched the man disappear into the room the poltergeist destroyed, just vanished out of thin air. And the Bailey packed their bags and left shortly after. The mansion is now deserted and is a hot spot for paranormal activity. So, enter if you dare. I actually don't even know if you can go in. Look into that, maybe. <laughs> Number one, Dumas Beach. And we all love a good beach vacation. If you're looking for somewhere sweet to lay back while sipping on something sweet, India is full of some beautiful beaches. But we are not here to talk about anything lovely, okay? This isn't top five lovely, although that would be just delightful. I would love to work on top five lovely if we're ever gonna make that a channel. Maybe you guys are listening. We're going to Dumas Beach, located along the Arabian Sea in Gujarat. The first thing you'll notice about this beach that stands out is the black sand which is already pretty unnerving. Most beaches don't look like that. The local folklore says that Dumas Beach used to be a burial ground for Hindu people. And as such, generations of spirits are ingrained into the sand. Building on this legend says that the reason for the obsidian colored sand is years worth of cremated ash by the burning of the dead, eventually overtaking the sand on the beach. So, I don't know, if you're thinking about making a sand castle, maybe think twice about that. Maybe keep the flip-flops on too, okay? So what do people say about the spirits out there? Well, it's been said there's a negative aura present in the air, and even just while visiting, tourists and residents say they can feel this sense of dread that something is wrong immediately walking around there. Locals say that the spirits of the dead walk down the beach at night, and visitors claim to hear inexplicable voices, scary laughter, and crying. So if you want a nice, long, romantic walk down the beach in India, just keep in mind that you're gonna have a bit of an audience with you. Some people go so far as to say that there's been apparition, floating orbs seen around the beach. Oh, I was having a bit of trouble finding any photos of any ghost sightings around the beach. People say dogs behave strangely, walking through it, howling and barking. There are some who believe that the animals can see spirits we can't, and this could be evidence of that. Now, the most extreme legends say that the tourists go missing around midnight on the beach, but I want to believe if people kept going missing on a beach, they'd shut it down, but I don't know. Coming in at number five, we have Bodie, California. Look 
Located up in the Bodie Hills in Mono County, California near Yosemite, in 1859 four miners found a good place to look for gold in the hills near the California Nevada border. Bodie died in a blizzard not long after, but small mining towns sprung up at their camp. The town was home to 10,000 people. Bodie was a mining camp in 1859 where people had seen gold in its hills. Eventually it turned to a well populated town. Though like most mining towns it saw its peak, its losses and then its decline. Fast forward to 1962 and the town would be fully abandoned. Although it already showed signs of decline with dwindling numbers at the start of the 20th century. A series of fires forced the last remaining residents to flee the town, leaving it almost exactly as it was in the early 1900s. Dinner tables are still set up, shops are still stocked with supplies and restaurants are still poised to serve long forgotten meals. Today the 110 silent building sits spaced out for traffic and people that aren't there. Buildings such as a barber shop, a church, a mill, a morgue and a leaning hotel is held up by a beam have been left untouched for 100 years. Though since it has been left and abandoned for years some of the buildings are in crumbing state of decay. While others stand strong, full of their original items but long devoid of their owners. There were also 16 saloons and thus a fair amount of danger. People were robbed and crimes occurred quite often, though the curse of Bodhi has nothing to do with the fires or the shootings. It started because people started taking artifacts from the abandoned buildings. They'd take weather worn shoes or pieces of glass from shattered windows somebody once ran off with a piano. Those items may seem like they have no value, but all objects carry equal significance in telling the story of Bodhi. Thus the curse of Bodhi emerged where if you take something from Bodhi, bad luck will come around to get you. Because of the rumour spreading of a curse, people who stole items would send them back. Often including heartfelt apology letters explaining that they didn't expect their fish to pass. Or their romantic life to tank from stealing from Bodhi. Coming in at number 4 we have Bannock, Montana. The once bright star of Montana is now a ruin. A town in arrested decay, with few remaining storefronts, saloons and hotels. The town was founded in 1860 when a group of Pikes Peakers from the gold fields of Colorado set up camp on the banks of the creek, finding gold that miners staked claims and promptly failed to keep the find a secret. By the spring of 1863, the area boasted a population of 5,000. By 1864, Bannock had started to fade, losing importance. The remnants of the past still exist with empty buildings and weathered wood. Today, over 60 structures remain standing, most of which can be explored. The town is known as a site for paranormal activity. It is known that ghosts of the abandoned town walk the streets of Bannock. The most common ghost story though is the story of Dorothy Dunn. In August 1916, Dorothy Dunn, her cousin Fern and a friend waded into a dredge pond and stepped into deep water, but none of the three knew how to swim. Luckily a passerby was able to save both Fern and the friend, but Dorothy was not as lucky. Today the site of the tragic drowning is referred to as Dorothy's Hole. Sometime after the accident, Bertie saw a ghost of her friend upstairs in the the hotel of the town. She recognised Dorothy by her long blue dress. Although Bertie rarely discussed the sightings, other visitors began to report seeing the spirit of a young girl in a long blue dress in the window of the hotel. Others have reported cold spots and some have reported trying to speak to the girl in a long blue dress. Bannock was filled with adult workers, crimes, murders and of course the notorious sheriff and outlaw Henry Plummer, whose vast gang terrorised and robbed southwest Montana for years. Henry Plummer was handsome, well dressed and charismatic. He was also able to gain the trust of the area miners and was soon elected sheriff of the community. However, little did the citizens of Bannock know, but their new sheriff led a secret band of road agents called the Innocents who began to terrorise the travellers between Bannock and Virginia City, robbing and ending more than 100 men over the next several months. Once caught for his terrible actions, Henry Plummer met his fatal end at the hands of the town citizens. Today many say that the ghost of Henry Plummer haunts this old settlement. Perhaps he wants to avenge his name. Number 3 in this list is the Vorgard Castle. This place has seen things guys. CN Traveler says, in the northeastern Danish town of Dronninglund, Vorgard Castle displays works by Raphael, Goya and El Greco to the public. But the stately building is also as renowned for 
its dark past. The most famous myth tells the story of Ingerbord Skeel, who acquired the castle in 1578 and drowned its architect in the moat so that he could never design another building as beautiful as Vorgard. People today report seeing Skeel's tormented ghost wandering through the castle at night dressed in white. Even if you don't believe in ghost stories, you might still get goosebumps passing by Rosdenton, Vorgard's most infamous dungeon. The room was designed so that an adult man can neither stand up straight nor lie stretched out, and there are no holes for light or air either. Ingeborg Skeel. What a freaking name, eh? Kinda sounds a bit like a robot, but I guess that was a human being back in the day. Also, let's take a moment and actively think about that dungeon there. So you can't stand up, but you also can't lie down, and there are no holes for light or air. Think about how horrible it would be to go in there. It'd just be a tiny little box. Like getting put inside that thing would be the torture. You wouldn't need to do anything else to the person. This place's dark history has made it one of the most haunted spots in Denmark. Which is really too bad because as CN Traveler described, the castle itself is remarkably beautiful. Number two on this list is Casa Loma. Now I had to talk about this one because it's actually located in Toronto, Canada and I have personally been to this castle before myself. CN Traveler says there is a gothic revival style castle in Midtown Toronto that, whether you realize it or not, you almost certainly have seen. On screen, that is. Casa Loma has made appearances in Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, X-Men, Disney's live action Beauty and the Beast, and as Hogwarts in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. This is partly because of the mansion's distinct architectural qualities, but also because of its legend. There are decades worth of reported ghost sightings, including the spirit of Sir Henry Pallet, its original inhabitant, and his wife Lady Mary for whom the castle was built. Even more frequently seen is the apparition of a maid from the early 1900s when 60,000 people in Toronto died of the flu. Now, I personally cannot attest to the ghostly sightings. I only went there once and I went right in the middle of the day when there were tons of other people around so didn't really get a chance to see anything too spooky. What I can speak on though is the tunnels. There are a ton of deep and long winding tunnels in this castle. They are all creepy as holy hell and I imagine that they've seen their fair share of death. I can't actively tell you not to go to this place, considering I personally have been myself, but I will say to tread with caution. And finally, number one on this list is the Bangar Fort. Located in India, this ancient fort has a curse that hangs over it. Deep in the state of Rajasthan, at the foot of the Aravali mountain range, lies an abandoned 17th century ruined fort city. One piece of local lore says a sadhu who lived atop the nearest hill permitted the fort to be built under the condition that it not cast a shadow on his own home. Once his mandate was disobeyed, he cursed the city. Considered the most haunted place in India, entry to the popular tourist destination is strictly forbidden after sunset. Nearby villagers whisper of paranormal activity, but skeptics say the after dark band's true intent is to protect people from the dwellers of an ancient tiger reserve. The gloomy aura and negative vibrations of Bangar Fort, however, are agreed upon by believers and non-believers alike. I don't know if I buy into the whole protection from tigers thing. Everything that I've read about this place and the personal accounts that people have reported seem to indicate that something evil and paranormal is definitely afoot. It seems that somebody really likes the sun and having anything get in the way of that causes them a big problem. So much so that they curse the place and the whole freaking city. Demon-like creatures have occasionally been reported. They're said to be a cross between a werewolf and a slug-like creature. Really weird looking, apparently. Locals are always on the lookout for them and tell their kids never to wander off too far to the fort for fear that they may never return. Coming in number five, we've got the Los Feliz Murder Mansion. Also a great name for an instrumental math rock band or maybe a spooky improv group. Feel free to use it as long as you invite me to the first show. The Los Feliz Murder Mansion is exactly what it sounds like. A mansion in Los Feliz where somebody was murdered. It goes further than that, as the circumstances surrounding the murder are quite grisly indeed. In the late 50s, this house belonged to Dr. Harold Perelson, a family man with a successful career. Those last two bits were just for a show though, as there was plenty of darkness hidden beneath the veneer of respectability. On one fateful night, he decided enough was enough and found his trusty hammer. Using this carpentry tool as an improvised weapon, he ended the life of his wife in brutal fashion. One 
attack wasn't enough either, as Dr. Perelson went after his daughter as well. Thankfully, he wasn't able to finish her off, but she was still gravely injured. Realizing what he had done, he decided to drink enough acid to burn through his insides and send him on to the afterlife. Chilling, to say the least. What would drive a person to commit such an act? After this all became public knowledge, people avoided the home for a while. The place where something so horrid happened can't be comfortable to sit around in. However, after a while, a family bought up the property and used it largely for storage. That's probably a safer bet than actually living there, eh? In 2016, the place was cleared out and most of the remaining stuff was auctioned off. Then, it sold in 2019 and someone new moved in. Maybe time did a nice revision and people forgot what had happened there. Although it doesn't seem as though the ghosts are very violent or surly. No, the hauntings here largely consist of things being moved around without anyone present. And speaking of present, there have also been reports of unexplainable Christmas gifts appearing around the house. Maybe these ghosts feel bad for how things went down and have decided to live a lovely family life once more. Interesting. Coming in at number 4, we've got the Mar Residence. The older a building is, the more likely it is to be haunted, yeah? Can we accept that as a fact of life? Good, good. So it should stand to reason that the Mar Residence, located in Saskatoon, is probably bursting at the seams with phantoms. This house was actually built way before the city even incorporated and is the longest standing building in the area. Of course it would accumulate some ghosts over the years. The main way folks might have ended up tethered to this home in the afterlife is through its use as a field hospital in 1885. Hospitals often find themselves creating many ghosts, as folks who suffer for extended periods of time or go before they're ready tend to stick around afterwards. The Mar residence also has a long history of different folks deciding to live there for a while, so any number of tenants may be haunting the halls. One ghost in particular causes a whole lot of issues. Appearing as an elderly angry man, the phantom flies around, tormenting any woman who enter the house. Some things never change, eh? No matter what era you pull an angry dude from, he'll always find a way to harass some woman he doesn't know. Classic. So if you're really freaked out, don't worry. The Mar Residence actually offers a virtual tour on the website, meaning you can shuffle around this creaky home without having to put yourself in the way of any spectral presences. They've also made an attempt to connect with all the cool youths out there by starting up a TikTok account. I can't vouch for its efficacy, but at least they're trying. Ghost stories in real life just don't have the same pull as online ones anymore. Interestingly enough, it seems to be a popular destination for weddings too, so if you really want, you can book your next event at the Mar Residence. There might be more than one lady in white though, and nobody can really get mad at ghosts for upstaging a bride. In at number 3 we have Thurmond, West Virginia. The historic town of Thurmond, located in the heart of New River Gorge, was established by Captain William D. Thurmond in the 1880s. Captain Thurmond passed in 1910, but the town continued its growth. During its height in the 1920s, the town was flourishing with a number of businesses and facilities in the railway industry. Thurmond had two banks, two hotels, stores, a cinema and offices, yet after a series of setbacks, Thurmond soon went from boom to bust. A number of factors played a role in the town's slow decline. The first problem was the increased rail competition and the emergence of cars. Then in 1930, a fire that led to the closure of the biggest hotel in the town, the Dunglen Hotel, only furthered the decline. The final fate of the town was the Great Depression, and by 1950, Thurmond was a ghost town. Thurmond saw a small revival during World War II when coal was in high demand, but it was not enough. Afterward, the coal fields began to play out. Today, Thurmond stands at just five person population, which is why it is nearly vacant ghost town, as the remaining residents either move on or pass away. The house and the land it sits on became the property of the National Park Service. Walking around Thurmon today is a sad reminder of the countless other boom towns which once thrived with human activity, but today is silent and forgotten. Many buildings have long since disappeared, either torn down or as in the case of the well-loved hotel, burnt to the ground in suspicious circumstances. Many of the family homes lie in increasingly decaying condition, while some have disappeared altogether. Leaving only behind a white picket fence and wildflowers, which still blossom untended each year. The eerie atmosphere of Thurmon led many visitors to believe that this almost abandoned town is haunted. In at number two, we have Cahaba Ghost Town. Alabama is home to many small towns. While some of these towns have very few residents, others are true ghost town because they've been completely abandoned. It's no secret that small abandoned towns give off an eerie vibe. As a matter of fact, one Alabama ghost town in particular that fits the bill is Old Cahaba. The small town of Old Cahaba is located in Dallas County. From 1820 to 1826, this small town served as Alabama's first state capital. Before the Civil War, Cahaba was a busy trade city located at the junction of 
the Alabama and Cahaba rivers. Over the years, floods and decay have affected this historical town. Thus, by 1900, the town was completely abandoned. Today, Old Cahaba is Alabama's most famous ghost town. Many buildings still stand, like the church, schoolhouse, and some houses. However, they have been left untouched for decades. You can still walk the streets of Cahaba and see the ruins and abandoned buildings, but make sure to keep your eyes peeled for the ghostly orbs that have been reported to appear in the garden maze at the home of CC Peggs. Additionally, many locals share similar ghost stories from the ghost town. While it's known that Cahaba is filled with paranormal activity, one groundskeeper that works at the new Cahaba Cemetery has reported hearing voices as they worked. While tourist groups claim to have recordings of unusual sounds, and others say they've captured unexplained lights or shadows in photographs. Another site that's reportedly haunted is the Barker House. This mansion was built in 1860 by Stephen Barker and contained slave quarters behind the house. After people started leaving the town in 1870s, the house was bought by Samuel McGurdy Kirkpatrick. It burned in 1935 and was rebuilt, but today it's in pretty bad condition. The only people usually left inside are paranormal investigators. Reports from said investigators include seeing a ball rolling across the floor on its own and a stuffed animal appearing to communicate with something else in the room. But the most well known haunting in Cahaba is Pegg's ghost. Colonel Christopher Claudius Peggs was the leader of the 5th Alabama Regiment and was wounded leading a charge at the Battle of Seven Pines in Virginia in May 1862. He died from his wounds two months later on July 15th. As the story goes, a couple were walking behind Peggs' home in the spring of 1862. As they walked, they spotted a ball of light. They tried to touch it, but their hands went right through it. It disappeared, but later came back and followed the couple. Due to all the mysterious crimes that happened in association to Peggs, seeing an orb around his former house is considered a bad omen and possibly even a supernatural warning. And finally, in at number one, we have Centralia, Pennsylvania. Located in a quiet valley of Columbia County, Pennsylvania, it's one of the state's least likely and least publicized tourist attractions. Centralia, Pennsylvania, once thriving with 14 active coal mines and 2,500 residents in the early 20th century. But by the 1960s, its thriving business and population hit a decline, and most of its mines were abandoned. Still at that point, over 1,000 people still resided in the town, and Centralia was far from dying until a coal mine fire began below. In 1962, a fire started in a landfill and spread to the never-ending coal tunnels that miners dug thousands of feet below the surface. And despite repeated attempts to extinguish the flames, the fire still burns to this day. 20 years after the fire started, however, Centralia, Pennsylvania began to feel the effects of its underground fire as residents started passing out in their homes from carbon monoxide poisoning. The trees began to die and the ground turned to ash. Roads and sidewalks began to buckle. But some residents didn't want to leave, despite the health risks. And for the next 10 years, legal battles and personal arguments between neighbors became the norm. The local newspaper even published a weekly list of who was leaving. Finally, Pennsylvania invoked eminent domain in 1993, by which point only 63 residents remained. Officially, they became squatters in houses they had owned for decades. In 2013, the remaining residents, which were fewer than 10, won a settlement against the state. Each was awarded 349500 and ownership of their properties until they die, at which point Pennsylvania will seize the land and finally demolish what structures remain. Coming in at number 5, we have Castle Stewart. Magnificently situated on the Moray Firth near Inverness, the five-star Castle Stewart is a sight to behold. A mere 7 miles from the heart of Inverness, Castle Stewart is an ideally located base from which to explore the scenic and historic highlands of Scotland. Walk the battlements with the ghost of Charles I before he lost his kingdom and his head, or with Bonnie Prince Charlie the night before his tragic defeat at nearby Culloden Moor. The property was held by the Macintoshes, but was given by Mary, Queen of Scots, to James Stuart, Earl of Moray. Moray was made regent for James VI, but was later assassinated. During the time that Stuart lived in the castle for an unknown reason, local residents began to spread the rumour that the castle was haunted. To disprove the theory, James Stewart offered a reward to anyone willing to spend a night in the castle. A local minister accepted the challenge and stayed in a room at the top of the East Tower. Stewart was hopeful that once the minister told the people that the tower was not haunted, the word of the castle being haunted would not spread. The next morning, however, he was found dead in the courtyard with a look of terror on his face. It was never explained what had happened to him and no killer was ever found. At some point in the night, he had either jumped from the window 
of the tower or he had been pushed. This only cemented the fear that the castle was in fact cursed. From that day the locals refused to enter the castle grounds. It lay dormant for around 300 years until it was refurbished and turned into the hotel that we know today. Guests who have stayed there since it reopened have experienced a number of hauntings. Staff have heard disembodied footsteps on the stairs at midnight, horrible screams and the ghosts of a headless man were seen prowling the corridors. Some people have seen a figure pass their window too fast for them to make sense of it, but caught a glimpse in their eye as if someone had fallen from the tower above. The reviews of the hotel prove that guests are convinced the hauntings are real, but they also claim to have enjoyed the stay. If you like being terrified by ancient spirits or tormented by lost souls, this might be the place for you. In at number 4 we have Chillingham Castle in Chillingham. Chillingham Castle is a 13th century stronghold famed for action and battles. With its fine rooms, gardens, lakes, fountains and tea rooms, the castle has an extraordinary ownership bloodline which runs back to the 1200s. Chillingham occupied a strategic position during Northumberland's bloody border feuds. Chillingham Castle was often under attack and often basked in the patronage of royal visitors, a tradition that remains to this day. Edward VIII came to hunt there and members of today's royal family continue the tradition with private visits to the castle this century. The medieval castle remains as it was, just with galleries that you can see today added in Tudor days. For the visit of King James VI of Scotland, the castle is a dark past at the hands of the once owner John Sage. Once injured he could no longer fight for the king, he begged to be kept on in some capacity. He was given the job of torturer and stepped into his new role with relish. It was said that he had a deep hatred for the Scots and little mercy, with over 7,500 men, women, and children suffering an agonizing end at his hands. Often, legs and arms were broken before they were thrown 20 feet down into the oubliette. With no way to escape, they were to eventually starve and pass away in pain and in fear. It was also said that John Sage met with an equally gruesome death after he accidentally killed a tribe daughter that he had been in love with. The father exacted his revenge and John was executed at Chillingham with parts of his body being taken as souvenirs, a fitting end to a life dedicated to such cruelty. One of the most famous ghosts is the ghost of the blue boy, often witnessed by flashes of blue light or halo. These sightings settled down when two skeletons, one of a man and the other a young boy, were uncovered during renovation work. They even found documents with the remains dating back to the Armada. Who they were and why they were hidden remains a mystery. Some of the smaller hauntings guests reported including footsteps being heard walking around the rooms and the taps turning on by themselves. Another common sighting includes those of the lady in white, who after suffering from being poisoned begged guests for water in the pantry. These are just a couple of the ghosts and hauntings around the castle. If you're brave enough to investigate you might find a few more. Coming in at number 3 we've got the Morgan House. Another tale of familial terror, this house is situated in Kalimpong, India. A husband wife duo moved in, sharing the last name Morgan. Of course, that's where this house got its famous name. At first, all seemed well with this young couple. They kept up appearances, went about their daily chores, and ensured that all looked well. However, they were hiding a dark secret. Mr. Morgan supposedly tortured his wife behind closed doors, beating her and performing terrible acts. She had no way to leave him, so all she could do was endure. As time went on, the torture got worse, and Miss Morgan was desperate for a way out. She stopped seeing friends, ceased leaving the house, and eventually became a total shut in. And after all that, it was too much. She took her own life, leaving Mr. Morgan to abandon the property. For decades, the house was left in this state, empty, dusty, and home to a ghost. But eventually, the Indian government stepped in and revitalized the structure, making it into a boutique hotel. The ghost story doesn't end there though. Guests at this hotel often hear the clicking of high heels and the sobbing of a woman in distress. Those who know the story of the Morgans understand that this is a sign that Miss Morgan is near, even all these years later. Coming in at number two, we've got Casa de la Poesia, or the House of Poetry. That doesn't sound too spooky, but poets tend to be pretty morbid, don't you think? Once belonging to Colombian poet Jose Asuncion Silva, this was a place of tragedy. Silva lived a life largely void of pleasure or triumph. Although he did publish some wildly influential and successful poetry, a lot of what happened in his life surrounding his writing was very sad. His only friend, his sister, died too young, leaving him all alone. His best manuscripts were lost in a shipwreck, and his family fell upon hard times, resulting in economic ruin. Needless to say, this lonely poet wasn't a very 
very happy individual. Eventually, after putting out enough work to support himself for a few years, Silva took his own life at the age of 30. After this, people began to hear whispers and shuffling from within the house, likely thanks to the ghost of Silva, a moody poet even in the afterlife. These days, the house is a museum. Guests come here for the poetry and the poltergeistery. And finally, at number one, we've got the Velisca Axe Murder House. Now, most of the houses on this list are well known for having a spooky atmosphere and trying to make people afraid simply through backstories. However, visitors are often pleasantly surprised by how little harm they do. Ghosts have a tough time actually hurting folks after all. The Velisca Axe Murder House has spooky legends and horrifying repercussions in spades. Made famous for a gruesome string of murders back in the early 20th century, folks have always been a little afraid of this shack. No running water, no power, no hope. After the young family was famously murdered and no explanation was discovered, rumors of ghosts and ghouls proliferated. Even today, most paranormal enthusiasts don't seem to want to actually spend a night. In fact, one investigator did in 2014 and did his best to find out what he could. In the end, he only ended up with a self-inflicted stab wound. So be careful when dealing with this fascinating old home. Who knows what you might see, hear, or think. Who wants to put in an offer on one of these? With prices the way they are lately, it might be your last chance to be a homeowner before the fall of the empire. Roommates are almost a given these days, why not opt for a phantom roommate? Coming in at number five, we have Omni Shoreham Hotel in Washington, DC. The Omni Shoreham Hotel was built in 1930 by the owner of a construction company. One of the hotel's major financial partners was Henry L. Doherty, who later lived in the hotel with his family, but left soon after his daughter died in what is known as the Ghost Suite. Although there is a haunted past with the hotel, it does hold many luxurious events. Franklin D. Roosevelt even held his first inaugural ball here, and many balls have been held here since. When Henry L. Doherty lived at the hotel, he occupied Suite 870. They moved into the hotel with their maid, Juliet Brown. One night at 4am, Juliet woke up feeling unwell. She rang the front desk, but unfortunately died before she could speak with anyone. Not long after this happened, Henry's wife and daughter also passed away in the same room. The cause of them passing is unknown. After this unfortunate string of events, Mr. Doherty moved out of the hotel. The apartment was then unoccupied for over 50 years. The Doherty apartment was since renovated into a hotel suite. However, since this was reopened, there have been a number of weird happenings. Guests soon reported hearing faint voices and witnessed doors closing and opening by themselves. Televisions as well as lights would also turn off and on by themselves, strangely all around 4am at the same time it's believed Juliet passed away. Some occupants also said that they came back to the room with the furniture rearranged. If you do you ever find yourself at this hotel, do not stay in the Doherty Suite. Coming in at number four, we have Admiral Fell Inn in Maryland. The inn has eight buildings which date back to the late 1700s. Before becoming an inn, the building had many different uses, including a ship chandlery, a vinegar factory, a YMCA, a boarding house for actors, and a sailor's lodging house. In 1900, Fell's Point was a rough place. It was full of sailors, mobster hangouts, illegal gambling halls, brothels, and sailors. A Christian boarding house and recreational center then opened, which was called the Anchorage, and the building is now the central structure of the Admiral Fell Inn. In the early 1900s, a lot of death was seen here. Mercy nuns would try to treat wounded sailors in the main building, but there was only so much they could do and many died. In 1985, it was renovated into a 38-room bed and breakfast and renamed the Admiral Fell Inn. 1996 brought upgrades and expanded it into the 80-room hotel that it is today. The inn is considered to be the most haunted place in Maryland, with many sailors even dying from their wounds or taking their own lives here. There may also be a number of mob victims Victims who passed away here due to the dangerous past. One room is particularly dangerous, room 413. This room was the scene of a ghastly murder in 1999. Christopher Jones, an uptown guest attending a pharmaceutical convention, was killed by Gary Mick. Some of the hotel's housekeepers often get a strange feeling when they clean the room, and others refuse to go in it at all. Some feel a breeze or a hand resting on their shoulder. Others have experienced sudden cold spots and shadows darting around the room. People have also seen floating sailors sitting where a fire escape once was. Others hear knocking on their doors 
floors from butlers who once were. There have been multiple times when the hotel had to be evacuated due to hurricanes nearby. When the hotel was empty and the manager went back in for a last check, they could hear partying from one of the floors, believed to be the old sailors who used to party at the hotel. Maybe if partying with ghosts is what you're looking for, this is the place for you. In at number three, the Swan Hotel in Suffolk. This luxury four star hotel is set in the middle of the historic Tudor town of Lavenham. In the heart of Suffolk, its oak beamed interior makes for a cozy feel, giving guests a sense of stepping back in time. It's said that a housekeeper who once lived there back when the hotel was a thriving coaching inn back in the 19th century fell pregnant out of wedlock. The baby's father was happy to marry the lady under the circumstances and promised to look after them both. However, on the wedding day, the gentleman had second thoughts and left the pregnant lady standing at the altar. Savage. It is said that after that she became inconsolable and very depressed. What is now room 15 in the Swan Hotel was once the housekeeping quarters, and it is said that the poor woman was found hanging in this room by one of the inn's workers. Her ghost remains behind to chill the spines of those that dared to cross her path. A security guard was working alone late one night at the Swan Hotel, and as he was doing his final checks around the hotel, he came into contact with her, which scared him out of his wits and sent him running in the other direction. Several guests have reported having seen her standing in room 15 in the middle of the night. Once a nun was staying in that very room when she awoke, startled to feel the ghost tickling her feet. I guess you either get lucky and she likes you, or she chooses to scare you half to death. In at number two, we have the Langham in London. One of the more upmarket entries on this list is the Langham in London. I know it's upmarket because Cher stayed there. How do I know? Because I stalk her life. Since opening in 1865, this five star hotel has played host to a number of infamous historical figures, both living and dead. With nearly 500 rooms and suites is really not surprising that a number of ghosts have been seen regularly at the hotel. The paranormal activity at the hotel became apparent when it was owned by the BBC when it was discovered that there were at least five ghosts that make regular appearances at the hotel. The most active of the ghosts at the hotel is said to be that of a German prince or nobleman who was thought to have met his death when he threw himself out of the window of an upper story room. Ghosts have seen his ghostly form moving through walls and closed doors and he is often accompanied by a sudden drop in temperature. Room 333 is supposed to be the most haunted. In this room, a BBC newscaster woke up to see a fluorescent ball of light which slowly took a human shape. The apparition hovered two feet above the floor, the lower portion of its legs missing. It was dressed in an extravagant Victorian evening wear. The announcer tried to communicate with the ghost, asking what it wanted. The spirit slowly started to move towards the newscaster, arms outstretched, eyes empty. The announcer fled in distress to the safety of his co-workers and told them of this encounter. A colleague accompanied him back to his room. Room. The ghost was still there when they entered, but appeared less visible and less threatening before slowly fading away. Other BBC staff reported seeing the apparition in the same room, though only in October. There have been reports from other famous guests that taps will turn on in the night and turn off when investigated. Many people often struggle to sleep here and have to move rooms or even hotels. And finally, in at number one, we have Mole Mason in Oxford. This hotel is the most unique on this list. It was once a large prison located in Oxford. They have converted each cell into a hotel. Room. They have 95 rooms from you to choose from. Starting with standard double house of correction to signature suite, that is a two story of cells converted to a loft style room. Oxford Castle functioned as Her Majesty's Prison Oxford from 1888 to 1996. One of the more notable prisoners to be held in Oxford Castle was Mary Blandy, an 18th century murderer who poisoned her father with arsenic. She believed the arsenic was a love potion that would force him to approve of her fiance, a Scottish nobleman who was already married. She was hanged on April 6, 1752. It's said that her spirit still roams the castle to this day. During the Victorian era, it wasn't uncommon for children to be imprisoned inside. The youngest inmate to be held inside Oxford Prison was Julie Ann Crumpling. She was just seven years old when she was sentenced to seven days of hard labour for allegedly stealing a pram. Perhaps the most terrifying report comes from one of the security guards who was on his nightly patrol. The security has long been very wary of the location and had experienced several things before at such an unexplained sounds, bangs and the usual phenomena. However, on one dark night when the guards was coming to an end of his patrol when his dog stopped and shuffled quickly backwards growling at something in front of him. It was then two large shadow figures appeared before him. As anyone would do, he ran as fast as he could. A few days later, his dog died suddenly. He believed he had been frightened to death. You can stay in rooms when prisoners were once tortured and even killed. Although the hotel has been fitted to be a rather comfortable boutique hotel, it does not erase the horrors that have occurred. Sometime in the 1970s, a group were carrying out a sentence in one of the cells, when poltergeist activity suddenly erupted. Things got so 
so bad that a priest had to be called to exercise whatever they had awoken. Would you dare stay here? I wouldn't, although maybe, we'll see. Number five, the Banff Springs Hotel. First opening in 1888, nestled in Canada's Rocky Mountains, the Banff Springs Hotel has played host to a variety of guests over the years, not all of them mortal beings. The Banff Springs Hotel is known for its variety of ghosts who allegedly haunt its halls, the most benign of which is Sam the Bellman. Sam McCauley was an old man from Scotland who came to Canada and became the head bellman at the Banff Springs. Sam loved his job and often joked that he would work at the hotel forever, even refusing to retire until his death in 1975. In the years since, several guests have reported a bellman in an antiquated uniform, matching Sam's description, wandering the halls, asking about their stay, and even helping guests who are locked out of their rooms. Less wholesome is the famous Phantom Bry, who according to legend, was married at the hotel in the early 30s. Apparently, before the wedding was Reception, the bride was making her way up the large marble staircase leading to the Cascade Ballroom to join her husband who was waiting at the top. She tripped on her own dress and fell down the stairs, making her husband a widower in the process. There have been tales of the bride haunting the hotel ever since, with strange crying noises being heard in the empty bridal suite and reports of a phantom bride dancing alone in the ballroom or making her way up the fatal staircase. The most disturbing of the hauntings is the events that took place in room 873. According to legend, a man was staying with his wife and daughter in the room when he went mad and ended the lives of all involved. In the years since, the ghosts of the child and her mother have apparently remained in the room, with guests being awoken by violent screams and finding bloody handprints on the mirror that the maids could not manage to wash off. The reports got so numerous and disturbing that the hotel management sealed off the room, making it unavailable for guests. However, despite the numerous supernatural specters you may encounter, the hotel's beautiful architecture and services, as well as the scenic mountain views, and the amazing skiing available in Banff will make you never want to leave. Number four, the Omni Mount Washington Hotel. Located in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, the Mount Washington Hotel was built in 1902 by Joseph Stickney. Sadly, soon after the hotel was built, Joseph passed away, being survived by his wife, Carolyn. Carolyn eventually remarried to a French prince, but the newly minted princess continued to spend her summers at the luxurious hotel, always staying in her personal suite, room 314. In the years since Prince Princess Carolyn's death, there have been several reported instances from guests and staff alike about seeing the princess sitting at the foot of the bed. The following story from one of the former employees is particularly chilling. In 1997, I was working as a housekeeper and had to clean room number 314, the princess's room. I went to service the room that newlyweds were staying in, and I knocked on the door and there was no answer. I opened the door, went in, and there was a little girl sleeping on the bed. Immediately, I went to the hallway to see my inspector and told her I couldn't clean the room because a little girl was sleeping. She said that was odd because the guests were newlyweds and nobody else was registered. She asked me to leave a note that I was coming back in an hour to service the room. I went back in the room to leave the note by the table. I walked in the room quietly to not wake the little girl up. When I looked at the bed, instead of a little girl, there was a woman staring right at me with the most scary smile on her face. She had black hair and was wearing a white dress. I got chills down my spine and I just stood there, frozen. She sat on the bed and kept staring at me. I ran out of the room and told my friend, who was also a housekeeper. We both went back in the room and there was no one there. I still have a hard time remembering that incident and I get chills every time I speak about it. I have many friends that have worked there and I heard a lot of scary things that happened. Oh, the day before this happened, my friend and I took pictures of ourselves on the princess's bed. Everybody tells me that I made her upset by doing that. There have also been tales of other areas of the hotel playing host to paranormal activity, such as this story of the ballroom. As I walked into the ballroom late one evening on a night where there was no performers, I heard the faint sounds of an orchestra playing. I thought a rehearsal was going on, and I went to see who it was. There was no one there. No one. As I walked away from the side of the stage, the lights suddenly went out, and the music got louder. It was surreal and very, very scary. I ran to the light switch and saw that it had been turned off. I turned it back on, and the lights went on for a second, and then the switch turned down on its own. The entire time the music kept playing, I ran out and found security and told them what happened. They went in to investigate and found nothing, no music, and no problem with the lights. Despite the various ghosts, the Mount Washington Resort provides guests with several
stunning views of the mountains and the famously beautiful foliage of the White Mountain National Forest. This combined with the amazing ski opportunities, the on-site golf course, and the fact that it has played host to several famous guests, including three U.S. presidents and Thomas Edison, will make your trip a memorable vacation that you'll never want to leave. Coming in at number three, we have Bali Gali Castle in Northern Ireland. This stunning Bali Gali Castle was built back in 1625 and is steeped in history. The original castle served as a place of refuge for the Protestants during the Civil Wars. During that time, it was handed down from fathers to sons, and in 1799, it was passed to William Shaw, the last squire of Ballygally. In the early 1800s, the Shaw family lost their wealth and the estate was sold. The castle sits on a beach in Northern Ireland. It has apparently been dubbed the Jewel in the Hastings Crown. It is reported that while William Shaw and his family lived in the castle, a lot of sinister things happened. William Shaw was driven mad, desperate for his wife to give him a male heir to carry on his legacy. When Lady Shaw did not deliver him a son, he locked her up in a tower at the top of the castle. There are two stories about what happened next. One claims that Lady Shaw fell to her death while attempting to escape, while the second goes that William pushed her from the tower. I am tempted to believe the second personally, since then it is said that over 400 year old ghost still roams the grounds, looking for her beloved children who she was separated from. She has her own dedicated room at the hotel to try and contain the hauntings, but there have still been hauntings with guests. She has been seen wandering the grounds late at night, others have heard her crying from within their room or feeling a presence that is watching over them. This is not a hotel you should visit with your children. If she mistakes you for one of her lost girls, there's no telling what she might do. Coming in at number two, the Hay Adams, Washington, D.C. The Hay Adams Hotel is only 1,000 feet from the White House and known as the closest you can get to the White House without an invite. The hotel is located on the site where the 1885 homes of John Hay and Henry Adams once stood. In 1927, a property developer bulldozed the homes to build a 138 room residential hotel. Hotel magnate Julius Manger purchased the property in 1932 and changed the name to the Manger Hay Adams Hotel. He owned the hotel hotel until his death. Manja died in this residential suite within the hotel. The ornate ceiling was the last thing he saw. This is not the first death on the land that the Hay Adams stands on. Adams wife Marion Hooper Adams took her own life on the site in 1885. In a fit of grief, Henry Adams destroyed all of Marion's things, including her photographs and papers. It is believed by many that Henry had a mistress, and maybe that contributed to Marion's oppression. Henry and Marion are buried together under a monument called Grief. Staff of the Hay Adams Hotel complain that the ghost of Clover is most active during early December, the anniversary of her death. Reports of doors mysteriously opening and closing on their own, a woman crying softly and voices of sorrow coming from apparently nowhere. Some housekeepers have also experienced being hugged by an unseen presence. The hauntings do not stop it from being the most popular hotel in Washington and has hosted many a politician, including the Obamas before inauguration. Just be aware if you do stop by, you might get a hug from the spirit of Mrs. Adams. And finally in number one we have the Marshall House in Savannah. The Marshall House was opened in 1951 by Mary L. Marshall on Broughton Street in Savannah's premier shopping district. It is the oldest hotel in the area, being one of the only houses specifically built to be a hotel. It is a beautiful hotel considered by architectural historians to be the finest structure Mary Marshall ever built. Although it started as a beautiful structure and still is to this day, it has had its share of death and horror. During the Civil War, the Marshall House was occupied by the Union and used as a hospital until the end of the war. It was also used twice more as a hospital during the yellow fever epidemics of the 19th century. When it came to restoring the house in the late 1900s, they discovered human remains under the floorboards. The house became a crime scene, but they soon discovered that the downstairs room was used as the hospital surgery room. It is believed that the remains of limbs that had been amputated during the war were discarded underneath the house. Since the bones were disturbed there, there have been numerous claims of hauntings within the home. Paranormal activity is a frequent occurrence around the hotel to this day. If you choose to stay there, you might notice the faucets turning on and off, lights that inexplicably flicker, electronic items powering themselves, toilets suddenly overflowing for no apparent reason, and disembodied voices that echo throughout the halls. One guest recalled, a room to be wary of, 306. The loud hall noises in the middle of the night happened on the fourth floor where we just happened to be staying. I've lived in many haunted houses, but Marshall House creeped me out completely. I love I loved it there, but I could not rest. Yes, it is old and noisy, but there's way more going on there than meets the eye. But what else can you really expect from a city built on top of dead bodies? If you want to sleep through the night, Marshall House is not the hotel for you. Coming in at number five, we have Capuchin Monastery Catacombs. 
Palermo, Italy. This location is not for the squeamish. The Capuchin Monastery Catacombs is home to thousands of well dressed corpses, one of the world's most bizarre and morbid tourist attractions. After walking through the monastery, you descend into the catacombs where you have the chance to share small, enclosed space with thousands of corpses that have been well preserved. Some hanging from the wall, some laying down, and others sat on benches. They believe that having the dead on display like this shows respect to them. Here, nothing stands between the living and the dead, other than a sign asking people to be respectful. The ill lit, musty catacombs have been separated into a few corridors, each one hosting a specific type of person. There is a room for religious figures, mainly those affiliated with the monastery, for professionals such as doctors, and a room for women. There is a corpse of a person that's said to be so well preserved that she simply looks like she is sleeping. She has been given the name Sleeping Beauty. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty terrifying. It is believed that the particularly dry atmosphere allowed for the natural mummification of the bodies. Initially, priests would lay the dead on shelves and allow them to drip until they were completely depleted of bodily fluids. A full year later, the dried out corpse would be rinsed with vinegar before being redressed in their best attire and sent to their proper room to stand for eternity. Who knows how many of their spirits still roam the catacombs with no way out? It's not a question I want to find the answer to. In at number four, we have Black Swan Hotel in York, England. The city of York was built back in 71 AD and was founded between 8000 and 7000 BC. First inhabited by Romans, then Vikings, it has a long history making it the perfect place for ghosts and spirits to roam. Some have even claimed that it is the most haunted city in the world. Just one of the many haunted locations in York is the Black Swan Pub. It was built for William Bowes, a merchant and sheriff of York in 1417, who also became Lord Mayor in 1428. There are few unusual features and stories surrounding the pub. There is a passageway that was built under the building. It is unclear why this was built, but there have been rumors it once led to the church. It has since been sealed off, but you can still see the stairs leading down under the building and a hallway leading off into the distance. The pub was used as a horse refuge during World War II, and there are even stories of men coming to the pub to auction off their wives during 1884. Through the history of the building, there have been a few spirits who have decided to stick around. One of the regulars is a workman in a bowler hat who regularly fidgets and tuts, as if he is waiting for someone to arrive. He is often seen walking from room to room or waiting at the bar before fading away. No one knows who this spirit is, but it is believed he has been here since 1850, when bowler hats were introduced. Some say he resembles Charlie Chaplin. But he is not the only spirit who inhabits the pub, also frequently seen as a young woman in a long white dress. She stands at the bar in the back room gazing into the fireplace. You can see the grief in the woman's face, she appears to be dealing with some kind of loss. This is just one of the many haunted buildings around York, so travel here at your own risk. Number 3. The Stanley Hotel The Stanley Hotel was opened in 1909 by the American inventor and entrepreneur Freeland Oscar Stanley. In the years since its opening, it has developed the reputation as being one of the world's most famous and influential haunted hotels, having been described as the Disneyland for ghosts. All throughout the hotel, paranormal activity is reported, with vacuums being turned off or having their plugs torn out of the walls at any given moment. But there are three consistent sites of ghost activity on the premises that we will explore. Floor. The fourth floor of the hotel was originally a cavernous attic before eventually being converted into the living quarters for the female employees, their children, and nannies. In the years since, it has been converted into guest rooms, but the spirits of the past are still known to stick around. Guests have reported seeing their closet doors opening and closing on their own, and hearing the sounds of children running around and giggling while they play. In room 428, guests have reported seeing the ghost of a friendly cowboy appearing at the corner of the bed, who is believed to be the spirit of Rocky Mountain Jim Nugent, a guide from the late 1800s who was known for only having one eye after being attacked by a bear. Another haunted location is the concert hall, which was built by Stanley as a gift for his wife Flora, who can often be heard playing her piano late into the night. Another spirit who can be found in the hall is a former employee named Paul, who used to enforce the 11pm curfew, and who now nudges guests and workers who are in the hall late at night, and will sometimes flicker the lights and tell them to get out. Most infamous is room 2 17, which is apparently haunted by the ghost of a housekeeper named Elizabeth Wilson. She apparently flickers the lights, moves objects, and will even unpack the guest's luggage. She is, however, somewhat old fashioned and will literally try and drive a wedge between unwed couples who share the bed, with several couples describing a cold 
force coming between them in the night and the man's bags being packed and left by the door in the morning. Although this has never been confirmed, when the movie Dumb and Dumber was filmed in the area, Jim Carrey stayed in room 217 and was so scared by something in the room that he ran out of the room half naked and screaming in the middle of the night. The hotel was on the verge of being closed down until an author and his family stayed at the Stanley in 1974, the day before it closed for the season. They were the only guests and the large empty ornate hotel left them feeling extremely uneasy. When the author and his wife stayed in room 217 that night, he had a vivid nightmare about his son being attacked in the hallways. And when Stephen King awoke, he had the idea for his best-selling novel, The Shining. In the years since the novel's publication and the release of the film adaptation by Stanley Kubrick, the Stanley Hotel has embraced its spooky reputation, offering ghost tours, having a television channel that plays the film on a loop, available for guests, and even constructing an elaborate hedge maze in order to make the hotel more like the fictional Overlook Hotel it inspired. The Stanley Hotel is a must-visit site for paranormal and horror fans that they'll never want to leave. And if they get lost in the hedge maze, they never will. Number 2. Ruthen Castle The Ruthen Castle in North Wales was built in the early 1200s by Edward I to replace the wooden fortress that stood in its place before, as a gift to the king's loyal allies, eventually ending up in the hands of Reginald de Grey as a reward for helping Edward assemble the finest army in the world. The modern castle was built within the original castle's ruins in 1826 before being sold to be used as a hospital in 1923 and eventually being converted into a hotel in the 1960s. Some of the most famous figures that have stayed in the castle over the course of its long and storied history include King Henry VII and his daughter Mary, making this a location that you can stay in that once housed the original and authentic Bloody Mary. Although, as always, summoning her in a darkened room is not recommended. One of the most haunted rooms in the hotel is room 222, where several guests have reported sudden and extreme drops in temperature, as well as hearing slamming doors and tapping sounds all around the room. Another consistent tale is the little girl, who is often seen at night knocking on guests' doors and running through the halls and on the roof while giggling. Also commonly cited is a soldier, supposedly one who died defending the castle while serving in King Edward's army. Army, who can be seen wandering the castle grounds dressed in full medieval armor. However, the most infamous apparition is the ghost of Reginald de Grey's wife, Lady Grey. She apparently caught her husband having an affair and in a jealous rage dispatched the mistress with an axe. She was sentenced to death and her body was not allowed to be buried on consecrated grounds and was instead buried outside the castle walls. Perhaps due to not being able to receive a proper burial, many guests and employees have reported seeing Lady Grey wandering the castle grounds as well as the room on the upper floor and in the banquet hall, still carrying her axe. Despite its creepy history, this hotel is known for treating its guests like royalty, providing them with a variety of different rooms at different price points and having a world-class spa, as well as the ability to participate in a medieval banquet and tours of the grounds, the dungeons, the drowning pool, and the whipping pit, making this one castle you won't mind being laid siege in. Number 1. The Emily Morgan Hotel Located in the American city of San Antonio, Texas, this gothic-style building built in 19. 24 was originally a medical center with its own hospital, morgue, crematorium, and psych ward. It operated in this capacity until it closed in 1976 and was eventually converted and reopened as a hotel in 1984. Although no longer a hospital, some guests have reported hearing hospital carts being wheeled up and down the halls and smelling the distinct smell of antiseptic on the 14th floor. On the 7th floor, where the psych ward operated, there are reports of a ghost bride who is known to wander the halls and wake guests with terrifying screams. In the basement, which used to house the crematorium, employees report the smell of burning flesh and the apparition of glowing floating orbs as well as disembodied voices crying out in pain. If this isn't ghostly enough, you can look out the window and see another notoriously haunted building as the Alamo is located directly across the street. With all the local history, you will never want to leave once you receive some of that Texas hospitality. Staying the night in a haunted hotel sounds like a stressful experience, but it still sounds preferable to staying at the Econo Lodge Motel. Number 5. John Zappas Museum For someone like John Zaffis, opening a haunted museum was always in the cards. It was practically destiny. Few people can claim to come from a legacy of haunted museums, but Zaffis can, since he's the nephew of Ed and Lorraine Warren, America's most famous 
and oftentimes controversial demonologists. Growing up with a large fondness for his aunt and uncle's work, Zaph has developed a love of the paranormal from an early age and saw fit to try and carry on his relatives work after their passing, opening his own collection of haunted relics the same way that the Warrens did. And what a collection of weird relics Zaphis has picked up. I'll shout out a couple of the cooler ones. The highlight for me has got to be this sword that was used to conjure black magic and the sword is in like all of the promotional imagery so it's got to be pretty good. Check out this photo of Zaphis where he looks like a dark wizard who's also a fantasy author. Among the blade are things like a cast iron skull that was used in occult rituals, plenty of haunted dolls and idols, an ornate elk skull thought to be used in something evil, and loads more. Zaphis does point out on the website in the frequently asked questions section not to worry too much about being exposed to this stuff as everything that's brought into the collection is blessed before taking residence. Although they do make a small warning on the website that there is a teeny tiny small chance that any residual evil might attach to you in the museum. So I don't know, make sure to wash your hands with hand sanitizer or holy water on the way out. I can't not include this by the way. But the website also states that if Zaphis believes personally that any of the items in the museum have become too evil or too haunted to remain safe for public display, he throws it into an unspecified body of water. So if you're looking to start a collection of slightly used haunted relics on the cheap, I'd just check out the surrounding bodies of water to the museum. Now unfortunately, John Zaphis' museum is currently closed. Hey, this list was about ones that had to be abandoned, right? Can't come as too much of a surprise. But for those who are hoping to get a good Good up close personal look at these cursed relics. Zaphis says he's been searching for a new location for the collection. Hopefully somewhere with some good ventilation, you know, really let all that evil air flow. And hey, if you're looking for more videos about haunted museums, haunted objects, haunted dolls, haunted everything really, we've got all more of that in spades. So stay subscribed to Top 5 Scary, keep the screams coming all night long. Let's keep going. Number 4. The Museum of Medieval Torture Instruments Pack up the whole family and make sure to stop by at the gift shop for the Museum of Medieval Torture Instruments. Don't worry, there's something for everybody here to enjoy. Make sure you take home the miniature guillotine. One quick look at their website is particularly illuminating. Our main product is emotion boldly proclaimed as their slogan. Yeah, well, agonizing pain is definitely an emotion, so I can't disagree there. The Museum of Medieval Torture Instruments really is exactly what it says on the tin. It's a massive collection of real historical relics and replicas serving to highlight some of the most disgustingly creative works of engineering ever invented. The kind of stuff that would make Jigsaw and his funny little puppet blush with anticipation. The museum's goal is to remind us just how truly unimaginably cruel human beings are capable of being to each other and the lengths to which we will go to attain such horrid ambitions. The phrase, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it, comes up a whole lot on the museum's frequently asked questions page on the website, which is good. So come, learn a bit from such classics like the rack or the brazen bull so you don't accidentally end up repeating those. I don't think I can even possibly describe what either of those horrifying things do without getting this channel permanently flagged. So if you're curious, maybe take the worst Google trip of your life or go up and visit the Museum of Medieval Torture Instruments. They've got locations all over the states for your pleasure, and there's even one in Europe, but I'm pretty sure that's a different one. The one I'm talking about right now is the American one. The one in Chicago even offers a ghost hunting tour. As some guests believe there are residual spirits tied to some of the more grisly equipment kept in the dungeons. Guests are invited to spend the night on their own accord or with the safety of a tour guide to try and uncover any of the spirits that are said to be still living there, including an old executioner named Thomas who loves his work so much he just never left. Sheesh. Nearly a thousand years and he still doesn't take a day off. Some people just love to have their nose to the grindstone. Or to forcefully shove someone else's face into the grindstone. To each their own. In at number three we have the Alaskan Hotel in Alaska. Built in 1913 during the gold rush, the Alaskan Hotel is the oldest hotel in the area. The hotel was built to be a luxury experience for those passing by as they advertised as a pocket version of the finest hostelry on the west coast. The high fashion and glitz were a paltry concealment for the legal and sale of illicit substances that went on there throughout its history. The hotel overcame many issues that it faced since opening, one being the 1980 imposition of bone dry prohibition. They turned their bar into a cafe serving soda while also running a speakeasy like most of the previous bars at the time. The Alaskan hotel was a brothel twice in her history, first legally and second not legal in 1977 which was shut down by the fire marshal. There is one main soul who inhabits the Alaskan hotel today 
and that is a gold miner's wife. She lived at the hotel while waiting for him to return. When he did not return, she began to support herself through prostitution. But then he did return. When he returned to his wife, he was furious with what she had been doing and then murdered her in the hotel. There have since been a number of sightings of her at the hotel. She is said to be very angry and restless. When she is around, the air goes cold and some have reported hearing footsteps wandering the halls. Some even hear crying coming from the walls, but it is unclear where the noise is coming from. There is also a number of abandoned mines located near the town, so if you are looking for ghosts, this is the place to be. Coming in at number 2, we have City of the Dead, North Ossetia, Russia. Not many people have been to the City of the Dead. It is a dangerous and long journey to reach the village. There are also myths and legends warning that those who do reach the city never return. Reaching this mystifying destination requires a three hour drive, taking you down a dangerous and hidden road. It is located in North Ossetia in Russia. If you do manage to reach the city, you will come across many white huts that look like houses. However, they are not. These are actually stone crypts. It is said that in the 18th century, a plague hit the city, leaving no one behind. Behind. The clans built quarantine houses for the sick. They would bring the food, but not the freedom to move about until death claimed their lives. The even sadder side is that people who did not have family to build the hut or bring them food simply went to the large graveyard and simply waited for death. It was a very slow and painful way to go. For those who dare to visit the city, a little well was created outside of each home. If you drop a coin in the well and you hear it hit the stone at the bottom, then the person who died here went to heaven. If you do not hear a noise, then this indicates that the spirit did not pass on. And May still be in the village. My advice would be don't visit this city. We don't need an 18th century disease. And lastly, in at number one, we have Crater Rock Castle in Victoria, British Columbia. What first appears to be a beautiful castle is actually a haunted home with a tragic past. The Craig de Rock Castle was built in the 1800s as a home for a wealthy family, coal industrialist Robert Dunsmere and his wife Joan. It was built over 2,300 meters and comprises 39 rooms. However, Robert died 17 months before the construction was completed. The original architect of the castle, Warren Haywood Williams, also unfortunately died before the finalization of the home. His son James and Alexander decided to finish the castle after their father's death. Robert's death caused a lot of trouble within the family. His sons James and Alex were disappointed that their father's business and assets had been left to their mother. They claimed that they had an oral agreement from their father that they would receive the family business. For the following years, they tried countlessly to get the family business from their mother, and after seven years, they finally finally received the title to the San Francisco company. Feeling financially stable, Alex finally married his partner of 20 years, Josephine. However, their marriage only lasted six weeks as he died on their honeymoon in New York. When he died, the family was torn apart once more over his will. Joan and James fought for years going to the highest court level. They did not speak during the legal battle and then finally Joan passed away in 1908 in Craig Doric Castle in Victoria where she lived for 18 years. It was believed that James wouldn't attend her funeral. However, he did at last. The house has now been taken over by the Craig Dark Castle Historical Museum Society. There have been many ghost stories presumed to be connected to the Dunsmere family. One of the main spectres is a woman who walks down the main staircase in a ball gown. No one has seen her in any other part of the castle and she never goes up the stairs. Could it be the ghost of Joan going to greet her husband? In the basement of the home, there have been sightings of a little girl crying, although they disappear if she hears anyone approaching. There have been multiple sightings of her. She is believed to be the youngest daughter of Robert who died just months after he did. As well as these sightings, there have also been other weird goings on around the castle. Often people hear the crying of a child from various parts of the castle. Objects would also move on their own when no one was around. Some can also hear a piano being played in the dining room when no one is present, but there is no piano in the castle. It seems there are many ghosts of the Dunsmere family within the castle walls who don't want to leave their home. Coming in at number 5, we have Westmark Fairbanks Hotel. Starting off with the Westmark Fairbanks Hotel located in downtown Fairbanks, Alaska. This is considered to be the finest hotel in Fairbanks. It was built by the former governor, Walter Hickel, in 1987, but has gone through some transformations over the years, but is still considered to be a go-to stay for couples, families, and business professionals. Not only is it a hub for tourists to stay, it also intrigues paranormal investigators who believe this hotel is indeed haunted. According to locals around the area, they have claimed to see an apparition
apparition like figure that resembles a huge man that spends the night in room 277. He likes to make himself known by pushing the beds, poking guests in the shoulder, and even ruffling up the carpets in the room. Another ghost that is often seen at the hotel is that of a little girl who is seen roaming up and down the hallways and sometimes she is heard laughing. Also, an apparition of a male often appears in the elevator or walks around the main entrance of the hotel. Guests who have stayed at the hotel have also claimed to have seen doors opening and closing on their own. Many paranormal investigators and enthusiasts are currently exploring this so called haunted hotel. So, more about their findings should come out in the near future. So, if you plan on exploring this haunted hotel, please proceed with caution and get on the internet and share your findings to other ghost enthusiasts. Coming in at number four, we have Gakona Lodge and Trading Post. Gakona Lodge and Trading Post is located in the Cooper River Valley in south central Alaska and is the oldest roadhouse in operation in the whole state. So, you know that it has a lot of history and stories from locals and people who've stayed at the lodge. Jim Doyle built the lodge, an ice house and a storage shed in 1904 and was named Doyle's Roadhouse. The original building still exists on the property today but are no longer in use. Before selling the lodge in 1912, there are rumors that a notorious serial killer known as the Blueberry Kid even stayed at the lodge. Between the selling of the lodge in 1912 to about 1920, the lodge went through many different owners until a Norwegian man and his wife bought it until selling it once again in 1976 to Jerry and Barbara Strang, who were among the first owners to report paranormal activity on the property. Barbara had a strange event happen when some of the kitchen workers had actually tried to contact a spirit in the lodge when the power just suddenly went out. Yes, the power did sometimes go out in the lodge because of the harsh weather, but Barbara definitely believes that this time it was in fact the work of the paranormal. Another story is about a man named John Paulson who would frequent the lodge not only as a customer but also a business partner as well. John always stayed in room number five and to this day people report hearing stomping coming from that particular room. John was an avid smoker and stories from people that stay at the lodge today say they can always smell tobacco coming from room five, even though there has been a no smoking policy at the lodge for almost a decade now. If you are brave enough to visit this paranormal lodge, you could even ask to stay in room five and maybe be able to hear the stomps and smell the tobacco. Number three, the Panang War Museum. I think it's a very good sign that your museum is a friendly, welcoming place. If you Google it and the first results are an article called The Horrors on Ghost Hill and a listing for an IMDB episode for a series called I Wouldn't Go There featuring your museum. It's either really hurting or really helping the tourism there. Well, if those warning signs weren't enough to deter you, enter the Panang War Museum, my little ghouls and goblins. It's been described as one of the most haunted spots in Asia flat out. The Panang Museum is built atop the grave of an old army fort built by the British in the 1930s, but was taken control by the Japanese in the late 30s in World War II and used to house prisoners for as long as the prisoners lived, which was um, usually not very long if the site of the guillotine is anything to go by. After the end of the Second World War, the place had become totally abandoned until it was retrofitted to become a museum and serve as a reminder of the grim reality of war and its costs. The whole place kind of has this eerie, abandoned ghost town vibe as you walk through tunnels and old bunkers, serving to try and replicate what it would be like to actually work and spend time in a place like this while it was functioning. Given the very grim nature of the content and the site itself, which was home to so much bloodshed, death, hatred, and all the worst parts of our souls, it's no surprise that the museum has an infamous reputation as a spot for paranormal activity. Guests have reported seeing strange sightings, unusual shadows, and feeling chills as they walk through the bunkers. But all of this begs the question, would ghosts even be scarier than the actual truth of this place? Now, I've never been, but from what I was looking at and gathering for this, it seems to me like the true horror of the Panang Museum is that it's a reflection of some of the worst parts of the human experience. A reminder of what happens during wartime and what people do to one another. This place doesn't need stories of spirits. It's haunted enough as is by the memories that will forever be tied to it. Number two, the Mutter Museum. Mutter is the German word for mother. That's your fact for today, so you can tell your Mutter that you learned something from this video. Well, this isn't a museum for moms or about moms, although they're more than welcome to come. The Mutter Museum in Philadelphia isn't quite like the other museums on this list. It's not particularly known for being paranormal or haunted, but rather it's a collection of medical oddities and curios all arranged behind cabinets in a very clean, professional manner. It's not known for vengeful spirits or anything walking the halls, but rather just home to an incredible amount of very creepy things in jars. Every picture of the place looks like something out of a mad scientist's lab, a background of a B-horror movie set, that one weird place in that one Harry 
Harry Potter movie. Maybe I'm remembering that wrong. Amputated limbs float in jars next to organs, fetuses from all sorts of animals you can imagine, and more bones than you could possibly shake a femur at. They got skulls of all kinds. They got skulls for days. They got an entire wall dedicated solely to the skulls of criminals, and all sorts of broken skulls and disarray eaten by tumors or other lovely diseases. If you're looking for skulls, they have got skulls. They've got a collection of famous remnants, Albert Einstein's brain if you want to see if some of that rubs off on you. Grover Cleveland's famous tumor, well we all love Grover Cleveland's tumor, pack the whole car up, let's go see that. You know. Fun stuff. Now, guests who visit the Mutu Museum do pretty frequently complain of feeling dizzy and uneasy while wandering through the collection. But whether or not that's because of some poltergeist or spiritual influence, or because you're wandering through a 6,000 square foot room looking at hundreds of brains, bones, and disembodied organs in jars, is up for some debate. I know just reading about this thing already makes me feel kind of squeamish, it makes my stomach feel all churny. I wonder if they have a little cafe in this one like most museums have. You think anybody's eating there? And number one, the Museum of Death. The Museum of Death. Well, I wonder what sort of topics they enjoy covering at the Museum of Death. I bet they have an absolutely illuminating look at pre raphaelite art of the late 19th to early 20th centuries. They don't? What? No, at the Museum of Death, opened in Hollywood in 1995, which was opened by a married couple with the intention to make people happy to be alive. Whew. How do they accomplish this? Do they show you pictures of whiskers on kittens and raindrops on roses? No, no, of course not. It's a collection of everything to do with death. Bones, skulls, coffins, ancient mortician's tools, executioner's equipment, and a whole lot more. Amusingly, the owners have said their goal is not to scare anyone with this museum. That's not what their museum is about. Now sure, they play videos of autopsies, and they have footage and imagery from incredibly grisly and stomach-churning real-life true crime cases, like artifacts from Charles Manson's family, or some of Jeffrey Dahmer's personal effects, but they don't want to scare you. The museum is there to show death in its brutal, unedited honesty. The owners themselves describe it as a commemoration of life. And I gotta be honest, I'm making it sound worse than it is, but it definitely does sound interesting. And the grimmest parts of me are definitely more than a little curious to check it out in that morbid sort of way, because it sounds cool. Probably a great date spot to take a goth girl, I bet. The museum does kind of embrace its sort of twisted reputation, it really runs with it. It hosts Black Dahlia costumes contests where guests are judged on who's got the best post-mortem Black Dahlia costume, which is something. It's not thought to be as haunted as some of the other places on this list, but it does really bring out some visceral reactions in people. Apparently it's not too uncommon for guests to demand to leave early or to outright faint while walking through the museum. The owners refer to these cases as falling down ovations, which is a very funny turn of a phrase. Now sadly, if you're listening to all of this and you're already pre-buying tickets for your next trip to LA, sadly the museum is currently closed down. They are reopening though. They've also got a museum in New Orleans. Since their collection of macabre knickknacks is so large it couldn't be contained to just one spot. When it reopens, I recommend you get out as soon as you can. It's a once in a lifetime experience. Eh? Number 5 on this list is Abbaye de Mortemer. This abbey is located in the French town of Mortimer in the Normandy region and has a deep history to it. In the mid 1500s this was a prosperous area filled with a bunch of monks. It was a growing town that was one of the most successful in the region. This didn't last too long though. When the 1700s struck, things changed quickly. The men who were funding this town grew greedy and cared little for the people that were living there. The abbey itself started to deteriorate and the monks began moving out. Soon it was a shell of its former self and only had four monks that it housed. This wasn't the end though because in 1789 this abbey saw the worst horror of its history. The French Revolution was at its height and sweeping its way through France. Religion was completely out of favor and that meant the four monks that were living there were also out of favor. When the revolutionaries got to this location and found these monks, they didn't hold back. They took them into the cellar of this abbey and brutally massacred all four of them with no provocation. People think that this was one of the main incidents that caused this place to become one with the spirits. Since then, many ghostly sightings have been reported at this spot. One of the most famous stories was in World War II. A British paratrooper landed in the forest nearby and was spotted by the Germans. He thought he was doomed for until a monk appeared out of nowhere and guided him to safety. It's believed that this is one of the spirits of the dead monks still trying to help those in desperate need. One of the most famous ghostly legends is the woman in white who wanders the grounds. This ethereal being floats through the area and was even photographed once before. Her origin is currently unknown, but it seems that after the monks were killed, this area became home to not only their spirits, but many. 
werewolves, goblin cats, and other demonic things have also been spotted here. This place is deeply haunted, and even though that one paratrooper was saved by a ghost, I think that's the exception rather than the rule, and for that reason, I still wouldn't recommend going here. Number four on this list is the Chateau de Brissac. This chateau in France is located in the Loire River Valley south of the village of Angers in France. It's a very beautiful chateau and extremely unique because it's actually a mix of two different chateaus. In the early 11th century, an initial castle was built on the land, but then several hundred years later in the 15th century, the land was taken over by the Duke of Brissac who had his own vision for the space. He tore down most of the castle except for the twin medieval towers and then built around those so you get this very interesting style of chateau. This chateau is also apparently the tallest in all of France. The great beauty of this castle and unique architecture aren't the only things that distinguish it though because it's also one of the most haunted. An expert on the castle named Wesley McDermott gives great insight into the entity haunting this building where he says, A double murder that occurred sometime in the 15th century within the walls of the castle has resulted in one of the more popular ghosts of the Chateau de Brissac, that of the La Dame there, or Green Lady. The current residents, the Duke of Brissac and his family, have become accustomed to her roaming the rooms, but she has scared many a guest. She's often seen in the tower room of the chapelle wearing her green dress. What's most terrifying, however, is her face. If she looks at you, you'll see that her face has gaping holes where her eyes and her nose should be, resembling a corpse. As well as her sighting, her moans are often heard throughout the castle in the early hours. After researching this, I found that Wesley was correct, and there is no end to the stories and encounters people have had with this green lady. I honestly do recommend going to this castle to look at its beautiful exterior. Going inside, though, is something that I wouldn't do. Coming in at number three, we have Van Gaalder Hotel. This is another hotel on our list, and it's the Van Gaalder Hotel, which is another very old building known for paranormal activity due to the many people who have visited and even locals. The hotel was built in 1916 in downtown Seward, Alaska. It originally was built as an office building, but then was converted into apartment buildings, and then finally into her hotel. The hotel hasn't changed much since when it was built, just small touch ups and interior changes have been done to keep the authentic feel of this very old hotel. The most popular ghost story from this hotel is that of Fanny Guthrie Bam, a woman who died in this hotel in the 1950s and is said to haunt room 202. She is described as a younger woman who has long blonde hair and wears a blue dress. Fanny is one of many ghosts that haunt the hotel, but the only one that can actually be identified. It is believed that Fanny was on the head by her drunk husband one night and she still roams this hotel to this day. An eyewitness account who was staying at the hotel in 2001 remembers that one night at 1.21am she was awoken to the whole building shaking and heard someone running up and down the stairs. The guest then asks a worker at the hotel if there was just an earthquake to which the worker told her no. The customer had actually experienced the ghost of Fanny reliving her murder. Along with Fanny there have been sightings of a lone unidentifiable man who is said to appear only as wisps and orbs as well as sightings of two men wearing bowler hats and can be seen standing behind the front desk. And also three children can be seen running from room to room, giggling when there are no guests staying at the hotel. If I were you, I would avoid staying at this place at all costs. Wish I knew where this hotel was. I stayed at a hotel in Seward, Alaska with my family once. And we had a weird situation, but it was just us. We were just the weird ones. We went fishing, we were fishing all day, getting rockfish. We're out in the waters. <laughs> And then we went back to the hotel we were staying at and we had planned to go out for dinner but we were like let's just take a light nap and we all woke up at like 2, 3 a.m. in our coats, jackets, like, it was like I don't, it was f***ing weird, like. <laughs> Coming in at number two, we have Tonsina River Lodge. Next on this list is the Tonsina River Lodge, which is located in well Tonsino, Alaska, and is part of the Copper River Valley area. The lodge is considered to be the centerpiece of Tonsina Valley. Originally named the Donaldson Roadhouse, it was built by Jim Donaldson in the 1900s, and then later in 1902, Jake Nafstad and Fred A. Martin added onto the main roadhouse building and ultimately changed the name to the Tonsina Roadhouse. Would later go under another name change, the Upper Tonsina Roadhouse. 
house and underwent some more accommodations which could house up to 60 guests. This hotel is very historic and actually was once a brothel before it had eventually become the Tonsina River Lodge. The most popular ghost in the lodge is Charlie who had been seen by many different workers at the lodge as well as tourists staying there. There are a few different stories of what happened to Charlie, one being that he was wanted for murder in Canada and went on the run. When authorities caught up to him he resisted arrest and was shot and died in room 18. Another account says that Charlie got rejected from his love interest and having nothing to live for he ended up taking his own life in room 18. And to this day he is seen wandering up and down the hallways looking for his beloved. A third version about Charlie is that during the Great Depression Charlie was living in Seattle and not being able to find work he boarded a ship and decided to go to Alaska, eventually making his way to Tonsina and getting a job at the roadhouse. He really enjoyed his job but unfortunately Charlie ended up passing away in room 18. His body was buried on a hill behind the roadhouse. People believe that Charlie was so happy with his life at the lodge even in his afterlife he never left. Many people who have come in contact with Charlie say that he is a very friendly and peaceful ghost and workers and tourists say they were not feared by Charlie's. So if you're intrigued by Charlie and his story you can go visit Tonsina Alaska and stay in his old room. And finally coming in at number 1, Hilton Anchorage Hotel. The Hilton Anchorage Hotel is considered to be a very famous place in the United States. Located in downtown Anchorage in 1916 it was first owned by Frank Reed. Many ghosts have come to stay in this hotel since the gold rush and have never left. One ghost that frequents the hotel is the first chief of police in Anchorage who often is seen in the night hours around the hotel. The story says that he was shot during the prohibition days with his own in the alleyway of the hotel and was then dragged into the hotel to try to recover from his wounds but would soon pass away there. Another ghost that is often seen roaming the hotel is a bride. Many visitors have seen her tall silhouette, dressed in white and dark hallways and mirrors throughout the hotel during the evening hours, as well as the ghost of a little boy roaming the halls of the hotel. Guests who have stayed at the hotel have reported frequent ghost sightings in various rooms such as 217, 215, 205 and 202. Over the many years there have been so many ghost sightings at this particular hotel that the hotel even keeps a log at the front desk of all the eerie experiences that have happened to guests and workers. The hotel has truly survived the test of time after going through the 9.2 magnitude Good Friday earthquake in 1964, which is said to be the most powerful recorded earthquake in North America and the second in all of the world. But soon after this is when the paranormal account started flooding in. Even through all the tragedy that downtown Anchorage has gone through, this hotel has stood its ground and in 2016 this hotel celebrated 100 years of business. 